Pinocchio, the story of a marionette. Once upon a time there was a piece of wood, it was only firewood and was not worth much. At least that is what someone might think, no, this piece contains something quite magical. Then one day an old carpenter, Master Antonio, who many people called Master Cherry, for the end of his nose was quite red, like a ripe cherry, no one knows quite, how it happened. But when Master Cherry found this wood, he was very pleased, he rubbed his hands together. And did so with delight, yes, quite joyfully and he did say these things, out loud, to himself. This wood has come at just the right time, it will make a fine leg for my table, is it time? At that moment he took a sharp axe to chop away the bark, the axe was up now high in the air. Yes, he was just ready to swing it when from nowhere, it seems, cried a tiny voice, quite fair. Please do not strike me very hard. Now Master Cherry was quite surprised at what he heard that day. He looked and looked around the room, were there children at play? He peered under the bench, in the cupboard, inside the box of shavings. For he knew, that somewhere close there was a child now misbehaving. He even looked outside, up and down the street, for surely he would find. A little boy or little girl running away, laughing all the time. But not one was seen, none at all, he laughed it off, it's true. He scratched his head in disbelief, quite grateful that it was no thief. Oh, I see how it all is, I only thought I heard someone speak. With that he picked up the axe and swung a terrible blow. Ouch, oh no, now you have really hurt me. Shouted the same tiny voice, Master Cherry stood quite still. No he did not move a bone, it was as if he had now turned somehow into stone. His eyes were wide and filled with fright, his mouth was wide open. Yes, his tongue hung down, near to the bottom of his chin, such a frown. Where on earth did that little voice come from? There is no one here, is it possible that this wood can speak and cry as a child? I cannot believe it, this is only firewood, if I threw it on the fire I could boil a pot of beans. Can anyone be hiding inside of it? If anyone is hiding in there, I will put a just end to his misery. Yes, I will settle this at once and for all. With that he picked up the little piece of wood. With all his might he beat it, very hard, against the wall. Two, then five, then ten times over and over again. Until his hands hurt and swelled, then he did it again. Then he stopped to listen and to see what he could hear. Two minutes passed, then came five, then ten. But he heard absolutely nothing, not a word was said. He looked quite puzzled, as he scratched his head. Oh, I see how it all is, I only thought I heard someone speak. He wore a whip and it came loose, his hands hurt, but he fixed it. Still, all this time he was quite frightened, he tried to sing for courage. He put the axe aside, took the block plane and tried to smooth the wood. As soon as he did, then it happened again, not like it really should. Stop, you are tickling me. That tiny voice did laugh, again and again, still again. Now Master Cherry did fall down, as if he were struck by lightning. When you think of it all and all, it really was quite frightening. When he opened his eyes he found himself now sitting on the floor. 
He was quite pale and the end of his nose was not red, but now blue with fright. He moaned and groaned and was not very happy about this curious plight. Master Cherry's visitor. Just then someone came, rap tap tap, knocking upon his door. Master Cherry wondered, oh what now, as he lay there on the floor. Oh, you come in. He groaned a bit, as he looked over to the door, from the floor. A little old man at once came in, after he opened the door. His name was Geppetto, but the bad boys named him Indian Pudding. For his funny yellow wig appeared much too much like pudding. Good day Master Antonio, but why are you laying on the floor? Oh, I'm teaching the ABCs to the little ants, what can I do for you? Geppetto laughed and looked about the messy shop, now so very cluttered. The wood, the axe and even the broom was nearly up in the cupboard. I have a kind favor to ask of you. I am here, ready to serve you, please, what is it you so desire? Master Cherry now gathered his strength and rose now to his knees. It really was his job to please each and every customer. Well, yes, this morning an idea came into my head you see. I thought I might make a wonderful puppet or marionette you know. Yes, well that could well and jump and play like a child. With it I might travel the world and maybe earn myself a fine living. Then came a tiny, boyish little voice that shouted quite out loud. Good for you, Indian Pudding, about time you worked. Geppetto grew very angry at Master Antonio and was quite cross. What was that you said, why do you insult me, I should pop you on your head. Poor Master Antonio almost cried, he knew just what had happened. He shook his head and did stand, for fear of being, again, flattened. I did not insult you, I would not do that to you good Geppetto. Yes, yes you did and I heard what you said, although it is not like you Antonio. But I shall not quarrel with you, please, could you give me a piece of wood? If you do I will go home and not trouble you again. Master Antonio grew really quiet and very really delighted. He knew just the piece of wood to give, the piece which had frightened him. But just as he picked up the wood, it jumped quite from his grip. It hit poor Geppetto with a terrible blow and right upon both his knees. Ouch, that hurts very much, oh, I think you have now lamed me. Oh no, please you must not blame me, I did not do it. No, it was the wood, it's the same piece that yelled at me. Geppetto was in great pain, he rubbed on both his knees. He tried to feel good inside, but he nearly started to cry. I do not believe you, wood does not yell, but I thank you for this piece. Geppetto did turn and took the wood, using it like a cane, he limped out the door that day. Master Antonio but was relieved in giving that particular piece of wood away. The marionette. Geppetto now lived in a very small room, it only had one window. The only furniture he did have was a old chair, a bed and a broken table. At one end appeared to be a fireplace in which a fine fire was burning. But the fire only looked ablaze, you see it was but painted. Over the fire there was a painted kettle too, well that seemed to be boiling. Yes and a belch, smoke and steam, it looked real from across the room. As soon as he reached home Geppetto took up his tools, true. He began to work on this piece of wood to make his fine marionette. What name shall I give you? I think you are a boy not a girl, yes. 
as he walked away he did sing, humming a tune, in good spirits. He pondered what to name his new friend, forgetting the pain, he endured it. I think I shall call you Pinocchio, yes, it is a good name that will bring you luck. I once knew a whole family that was named Pinocchio. The father was Pinocchio, the mother Pinocchio. Yes, their child was Pinocchio and they all did quite well. Having now deciding upon a name he continued the work in earnest. First he carved the hair and forehead and then the eyes he burnished. Ah, but no sooner did he finish the fine eyes, he became quite surprised. For they moved about and so curiously watched him, blinking very freely. Wooden eyes, why now do you stare at me? I believe I just saw you win. Geppetto appeared even a wee bit angry, but quite more curiously dismayed. He took his knife and made a fine nose, but when he finished it, the nose did grow. And it grew and grew and grew some more, it seemed it would never stop. Geppetto was in disbelief, he cut it short then shorter still, it would just grow back longer. First the eyes moving, winking and blinking, now this nose growing back again. He cut it off entirely and it just grew back, never had he dreamed of such a thing. Now he began to carve the lips and mouth so carefully, cutting here, shipping there. Now, even before he was done the mouth began to laugh and they got him much fun. Oh no, now you stop laughing at me, you must stop that, immediately. The mouth then did stop laughing but only momentarily. Then it stuck out its long term, now, as far and long, as it would go. Poor Geppetto pretended not to see this wicked act, he worked away. Soon the mouth was finished, he made a chin, then the arms and hands. No sooner than the ten little fingers were sanded fine and smooth. Geppetto turned away for just a moment and felt his wig slip from his head. Pinocchio, no, you must give me back my wig. But instead of giving it back, little Pinocchio put it on his own head. His little puppet made Geppetto cry, he dried a tear but felt very sad. You little rascal, you are not even finished and are a very, very bad boy, you do not respect your father. Geppetto continued his work making the little legs and the fine feet. But before they were finished they began to kick him, right on his seat. Oh no, I deserve it. Now it's too late, I should have thought of it before. Geppetto forgave Pinocchio, gently placing the marionette with his feet on the floor. He began to teach him to walk, first his legs were stiff, one foot went before the other. Pinocchio went away. Only, after a few moments Pinocchio began to walk on his own and even run around. Around and around the small room he ran, he did not stop for anything. In the excitement Geppetto had forgotten to close the room door, oh, those little feet. Bad little Pinocchio ran very fast, jumped out that door and ran out down the street. Stop him, oh somebody please stop him. Geppetto cried aloud, running quite after him, but was much too slow, Pinocchio was gone. He leaped like a rabbit, yes, his wooden feet went clip-clop, as they hit the ground. Stop him, someone stop him, please. The town folk only stood and stared in wonder, as Pinocchio ran past them. They never saw such a thing, laughing at poor Geppetto running after him. There was a good soldier who heard the noise and thought a colt had escaped his master. 
He placed himself in the road with his feet spread apart, so that nothing now could pass him. Pinocchio saw him and it tried to escape him by running between his tall legs. But the soldier caught him by his very long nose and he did so firmly hold him. Geppetto caught up to them and the kind soldier did release the boy to him. Geppetto wanted to pull his ears, but forgot he had yet to make them. He did then take the marionette by his wooden neck and led him quite away. Everyone around him looked upon them with a sense of wonder as they went on their way. Well you bad little boy, we will go home now and settle this affair, yes, once and for all. Geppetto was heard to say, Pinocchio would not walk and threw himself upon the ground. There he did lay, soon a crowd of idle persons came and made a ring around them both. Poor little marionette, he is not wishing to go home. After all, who knows how bad old Geppetto will beat and punish him. Many people began to gather on that magical day, someone else was heard to say. Geppetto seems like a good man, but with boys is known to be cruel, he may tear him apart. A policeman was there, summoned by the great noise and commotion. He overheard what was said and decided to make a motion. He forced poor Geppetto to release Pinocchio and led him straight to jail. Poor Geppetto he did cry and had no money in his pocket for to make his bail. That wicked boy, I tried so hard to make a good marionette. It serves me right, I suppose, yes, I should have thought of it before. The talking cricket. Now it may be hard to believe but this is said to have happened. That little impish Pinocchio ran home as fast as his legs could carry him. In his hurry he jumped over banks, hedges and ditches full of water. Very much like wild animals would have done if chased after by hunters. When he came to the home, the door was still wide open. He threw himself on the floor to rest, but quickly jumped up again. Cree cree cree, cree cree cree, cree 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 cree. Yes, there was someone else in that small room with him. Pinocchio looked and looked about and under all the things around him. Who calls me? Who is in here? You better get out right now. Pinocchio was truly somewhat frightened. He turned his head quite around. Something in that room made his perfect little smile turn down into a frown. It is I, I'm right up here upon the wall. Pinocchio did not know much, he looked and looked at all the little room's walls. Then turned around and saw only a large black cricket crawling, almost about to fall. Tell me cricket, who may you be, I see you on that wall. I am the talking cricket, I have lived here for more than a hundred years. Pinocchio looked very displeased, he did not like the big black bug. It does not matter to me how long you have lived here, you cricket. This home is mine now and you will do me a favor by going away at once. If you want to go on living, keep going, don't even turn around. I will not go away until I have told you a great truth. The wise cricket advised his wooden friend. Well, then you must tell it to me then, but be quick about it and it better be good. Woe upon those bad boys who rebel against their parents and run away from home. They will never have very good luck, sooner or later they will be very, very sorry. Pinocchio was not impressed with what the talking cricket was saying. Sing away, little cricket, as long as you please, I do not care for sorrow. I have made up my mind to run away and will do so first thing tomorrow. 
If I stay here, what happens to other boys will happen to me also. No, I shall be sent to school and then made to study. I can tell you right now, I do not wish to study. I would prefer to chase butterflies and climb trees. Yes, and take baby birds from their nests. The curious cricket heard every word that little Pinocchio said. Poor little goose, do you not know that you will grow up to be a perfect donkey? Yes, that is quite true and everyone in the world will make fun of you. Hold your little tongue you dumb, wicked cricket, you are nothing but a bug. Pinocchio shouted and was angered and very annoyed by what the cricket said. But if you don't wish to go to school, why not learn a good trade? Yes, you could help good Geppetto and earn your keep and bread. So do you want me to tell you? Well, I will tell you, in all the trades in the world there is only one I like. It is to eat, drink, sleep and just amuse myself, lead idle life and from morning until night. Quote. The cricket listened to what the bad boy said, only shaking his head. As a rule, those who follow that sort of lazy life, always end up in jail or a hospital. Take care little bug, you do not want to see me angry. The cricket almost laughed, if a cricket could laugh. Cree, cree, cree. Poor wooden-headed Pinocchio, how I pity you. Geppetto must have done something very bad to deserve a boy like you. Now with these words Pinocchio grew very, very angry, he looked at all the tools. Then finding a wooden mallet, he flung it across the room at the big old cricket. Now no one is quite sure just what happened after that, the mallet hit the wall, it's true. But the talking cricket was heard to chirp, cree cree cree, but was not heard again. Pinocchio's hunger. Night was coming on and Pinocchio had eaten nothing all day. In fact, his hunger grew, he could not wait to find something to eat. Seeing the boiling kettle he ran over to the fireplace, the look of hunger on his face. He tried to take off the lid and found it was only but a still painting. Now, to top it off, his big nose began to grow again and became three inches longer. One can only imagine his pain and feelings as he ran around the room, no stronger. He looked in drawers and in the cupboards for just a little piece of bread. Hunger was attacking him now there was a gnawing in his tummy and head. He thought there might be a bone, a heel or even a crust of bread, he looked and looked. But nothing could he find, his hunger grew and grew, until he felt like fainting. The talking cricket was right after all, it was wrong to disrespect my father. If he were here here right now I would not be dying of, oh this dreadful hunger. At that very moment, to his dismay, laying there on the floor, a few inches away. A hen's egg was round and white and tantalizing, he did reach out and seize it. Thinking it was a dream, he rolled it in his hands, he felt and kissed it gently. This was all too good to be so true, Pinocchio was really very quite delighted. Now then, how shall I cook it, in an omelette, shall I fry or, yes, boil it? No, the quickest way of all is to cook it in a bowl of hot water. He made a fire on the stove, found the pot now with the handle. He could not find any matches though, so he lit it with the candle. He poured some water and waited a few moments looking for hot steam. It wouldn't be long now, before he would be eating this egg, it was like a dream. When the water began to boil, he broke the eggshell right over it. But instead of the yolk and egg white, a baby chicken hopped out of it. It was such a sad thing for hungry Pinocchio, as he gazed on in disbelief. 
The baby chick was so gay and polite, as it made a cute bow then spoke. Many thanks Master Pinocchio, for saving me all the trouble of breaking the shell. Goodbye sir, until we may meet again, be well and give my best wishes to Master Geppetto. As the baby chick said this it fluttered its tiny wings and flew out the window, not door. Poor Pinocchio could only stare, he began to cry and scream, stamping his feet on the floor. Oh yes, the talking cricket was quite right, if I had not run away from home. If only my papa were home right now, I would not be dying of hunger. Now the very sight of food with the egg had made him even grow much hungrier. He decided that he would leave the house and look for someone who might feed him. Pinocchio loses his feet. Now it came to be a wild and stormy night, the thunder was terrible, lightning was quite bright. Even the sky seemed to be on fire, a strong wind did blow great clouds of dust, hiding any light. The tall trees began creaking and bending, poor Pinocchio now was quite afraid of thunder. But still he ached with hunger still, which was much stronger than any deepest, darkest fear. He left the house and slammed the door loudly behind him, as fast as his legs would carry him. He ran so fast to the village that he began to pant like a big bad dog after a long chase. But woe was upon him, for he found the village all dark, now closed, empty and deserted. The windows were all shut, there was no light, no cats or dogs, like in the land of the dead. Pinocchio went to a home, found a doorbell and began to ring with all his might. Thinking to himself it would surely awaken and bring out somebody on this awful night. So it did, after a few moments a grey-bearded little old man in a nightcap came. He threw open the window, quite angry it would seem and he looked very, very mean. Who is there, what do you want at such an hour of the night? Kindly sir, I'm Pinocchio, my papa is Geppetto and I'm very hungry. Could please give me some pie, or a little piece of bread? The mean-looking old man frowned and pondered the matter now before him. Surely this was one of the bad boys who rang doorbells to disturb people who lay sleeping. Wait there little boy, I will come right back, directly. Pinocchio was pleased and he obeyed the man, waiting for him patiently. In a minute he returned and the window once again was thrown open. Little boy, come near the house and hold out your cap, I have something here, for you. Pinocchio pulled off his cap, moving ever closer to the open window. Out came a great pot of water which now was poured down all over him. It wet him good from head to foot, as if he were a pot of dyed up roses. The old man laughed and slammed the window hard, Pinocchio was soaking wet. Yes, he looked like a large wet puppy, he ran out the water the best he could. But was deeply hurt, a little cold and shaken, he walked home feeling like a wet chicken. When he got there he was tired, wet and still very hungry, he set a chair quite near the stove. Still burning from the egg, his feet were wet and he placed them near the fire to dry them. He then did fall off to sleep, straight to dreamland, but his feet of wood now caught on fire. Yes, they were burned to coals and cinders, but he slept on so tired and weak from hunger. Then at last at just before daybreak, he awoke, as someone was knocking at the door. He had yet to notice, that his little wooden feet had burned down almost to nothing. Who is there? He was yawning and rubbing his eyes. Pinocchio it is I, oh, let me in please. 
It was his papa, Indian pudding, Geppetto. Geppetto returns home. Just as soon as he heard his father, Pinocchio jumped up and started for the door. But after he had stumbled two or three times he fell flat, face first on the floor. Pinocchio opened the door. Dear Papa, I want to too but I cannot. The noise he made falling was like a bag of wood dropped from a fifth story window. Poor Pinocchio could only toss about and roll around on the floor, he could run no more. Why can't you? Please unlock the door. Because my feet have been eaten up, something ate my feet, oh Papa I'm afraid. That's nonsense and just, who has eaten your feet, the man on the moon? Pinocchio noticed the cat playing with some wood shavings, thinking that was his feet. He really was very, very upset and he started to cry, still hungry, he needed to eat. The cat papa, the kitten did eat my feet. Cats do not eat wood, if you don't open the door, when I get in I shall punish you severely. Geppetto thought Pinocchio was trying to fool him, he climbed up and through the window. He was very angry, but when he saw him lay so helplessly on the floor, he felt very sorry for him. My little Pinocchio, how did you happen to burn your feet? Believe me father I cannot walk, no, I shall have to walk on my knees the rest of my life. He picked Pinocchio up into his arms and kissed him right on his wooden forehead. Geppetto was very puzzled and upset as to what had happened, he carried him to the bench. It was a terrible night with very loud thunder and lightning. I was very hungry and the talking cricket told me I was a bad boy because I ran away. He teased me and he told me I had a wooden head. I threw the mallet and he died, oh, but I did not wish to kill him. In the first place Pinocchio, crickets sing, but they do not talk. Then I found an egg and tried to cook it, but a chick fell out and flew away. I went to the village to beg for something to eat, but a mean man threw water on me. I came home and I sat close to the stove to dry, when I awoke they were burned away. And you do not know what pain hunger brings, there is no food here, I'm so hungry. Geppetto listened carefully but could not understand all the things the puppet was saying. He knew Pinocchio must be hungry but probably was the whole night and hurt himself playing. These three pears were to be my breakfast, but I'm glad to give them to you. Geppetto pulled three pears from his coat pocket, he had bought them at the store. Pinocchio became very excited and sat up eagerly nearly falling on the floor. Good Papa, but if you wish for me to eat them, be kind enough to first peel them. Now I must peel them. I'm surprised to find that you are so very dainty. In this world one must learn to eat anything that is set before him. But good Geppetto found a knife and healed all three pears, placing the skins upon a plate. Little Pinocchio was very happy, all but the cause, he ate and ate and ate. No doubt you are right, but I never eat fruit that has not been peeled. Pinocchio was just about to throw away the cause of the three pears. But Geppetto was not pleased, catching him by the arm, being one who cares. In this world everything may be of some use, do not throw food away. This may be so, but I have made up my mind I shall never eat any cause. Pinocchio seemed annoyed, even somewhat angry with his father's great ambition. Geppetto took the cause and put them on the plate with the skins, demanding recognition. Papa, is that all we have? I'm still quite and very hungry. 
My dear boy, I have nothing else to give you, only the skins and those three claws. He sighed some and felt strange, but began to eat the skins, making a sour great face. Then, when they were gone he groaned a bit and ate all three claws sitting on the plate. You were right, now I do feel better. Now you see, I was right, when I said that we must not be too particular about what we eat. I meant it, when must not waste food, we can never tell what might happen to us next. The new feed. No sooner had he satisfied his aching hunger Pinocchio began to cry, for he had no feet. But Geppetto punished him for running away, he let him cry and carry on, for a half a day. Why should I make you new feet, perhaps you wish to run away from home again. If you do, I promise you I will be a very good boy, I will go to school and study hard. All bad boys say those things, if only to get their way, yes, when they want something. But I'm not like other boys, I'm better than them all and I always speak the truth. I promise you I will learn a trade, so that I shall be able to care, for you, when you are old and feeble. My kind father, see you will need me then, yes, just like I need you now. Geppetto tried to look cross, but his heart was full of tears and love for Pinocchio. He took up his tools and two small, fine pieces of wood and went right back to work. In less than an hour new feet were finished, swift, graceful little feet, as if made by a fine artist. Pinocchio watched on, as his papa did his fine work, a true craftsman, surely was he. Now dear boy, shut your eyes and take a nap and I will mend your feet. Pinocchio shut his eyes but only pretended to take his nap, laying there looking fast asleep. Geppetto cleared the burnt feet away, took some glue and attached the new, neat little feet. He did it so well that none could tell where the little legs and racy feet were joined. Pinocchio saw he had new feet and eagerly jumped down from the bench where he was lying. He then leaped to the floor, paraded about so proudly, dancing merrily around the room. Geppetto was very pleased with his work, so was little Pinocchio, as he danced with the broom. To pay you for what you have done for me, I will go to school at once, as I promised. Oh good, then you are a good boy, a good boy indeed. But if I go to school I must first have some clothes. Geppetto was not a wealthy man, a beggar with not as much as a penny in his pocket. But he was resourceful, making now a fine suit of clothes from wallpaper printed in flowers. Then he made a fine little cap of brown paper with a pretty peacock feather stuck in the side. There was no mirror in the house, so Pinocchio ran to look at himself in just a pail of water. Why, I look just like a fine gentleman. Yes indeed, but remember fine clothes do not make a gentleman, but clean clothes do. Pinocchio was so pleased with himself he danced and pranced around like a little pony. Geppetto looked on and applauded him, as he was so delighted, they both laughed gaily. But I'm still in need of the most necessary thing, Papa, I need a spelling book. Quote. A spelling book, yes, you are very right, but how shall we get one? Oh that is easy, you have only to go to the bookstore and buy one. Easy to say, I have no money, but wait just one minute, yes, I have an idea. Geppetto thought a few moments then put on his old wool coat and fled the humble home. Pinocchio sat in wonder what his papa would do, Geppetto was back in just a minute or two. He returned with a nicely wrapped spelling book, but Geppetto was in his shirt sleeves. Outside it was now snowing, Pinocchio was quite curious, but seeing was believing.
Where is your coat, Papa? It is cold and snowing. Did you forget it at the bookstore? I have sewn the coat. It was much too heavy and it made me too warm. Pinocchio understood the answer. He threw his arms around Geppetto, hugged and kissed him. Geppetto became very red and embarrassed but proud of what he had done, hugging his son. Pinocchio sets out for school. As soon as it stopped snowing Pinocchio set out for school, his spelling book under his arm. He waved goodbye to good Geppetto, who reminded him to be good and to do no harm to anyone. Today I shall learn to read, tomorrow I shall learn to write. And the day after I shall learn to work out arithmetic problems. Then I shall be able to earn a great deal of money. Yes, I will buy my papa a new coat made of gold and silver, with diamonds set for buttons. While he was saying this he clearly heard the rhythm of fine music, he did stop to listen. It was the sound of fifes and drums, it really was so fantastic he danced to the rhythm. Oh where can that music be? What a pity it truly is I have to go to that old school. Taken by the magic sound he danced in place, deciding just what he really should do. He knew he should go right to school, but the fifes and drums sounded so very cool. Yes, today I shall go hear the fifes and drums, tomorrow I shall go to school. Then he ran on and came nearer to the sound of the fifes and pounding drums. He found himself in a group of people crowding into a building painted many colors. What is this place? I really must get inside. There was a small boy standing near the door who answered Pinocchio's question. Read the sign then you will know. I should be glad to read it, but I do not know how to read. You blockhead, then I will read it for you. It says Great Marionette Theater. Oh boy marionettes. Has the play begun? How much does it cost to get in? It is beginning now and it costs two cents to get in. Would you be so kind to lend me two cents until tomorrow? I should be very glad to lend them to you tomorrow, I cannot spare them today. I will sell you my coat for just two cents, it is new today. The boy laughed looking at Pinocchio and just shook his head no, no. What would you think I would do with the paper coat, if it rained I could not get it off my back. Come to think of it I would look very, very strange wearing a coat like that. Will you give me two cents for my brand new spelling book? I am a boy and I do not buy spelling books from boys, no thank you. There was a man who bought old clothes who had heard what the two boys were saying. He made his way over to them knowing this sounded like a very good, good bargain. I will buy the spelling book for two cents, in fact I will offer three. The bargain was struck, the deal was made and the book changed hands right there. But to think of poor Geppetto at home in shivering cold, because he had sold his coat. Pinocchio was happy though and made his way inside, pay two cents, with a penny to spare. He looked and looked and moved around near the stage trying to find an empty chair. Pinocchio goes to the show. But the show almost ended when Harlequin and Punchinello were up there on the stage. Yes, all the people were laughing at all the funny things they said and did much like a parade. But as soon as they saw Pinocchio, Harlequin stopped and pointed a finger at him. Everyone stood and stared at him sitting upon his chair, he heard his name and smiled. Do I dream or am I awake? Surely that is our Pinocchio. Punchinello gazed out into the crowd and all the theater went silent.
It is indeed Pinocchio and in a new coat and fine feathered cap. Now all the marionettes ran out onto the stage and they shouted out all at once. It is his Pinocchio, it is him, it is our brother Pinocchio, long live Pinocchio. Harlequin stood with open arms seemingly the chief of all marionettes. Pinocchio, come up here and throw your arms around all your wooden brothers. At this invitation Pinocchio made a leap from his chair right on the head of the band leader. In three leaps he was right up on that stage embracing, hugging and kissing all the marionettes. They danced around, all very delighted with Pinocchio, who was their long lost friend. But this activity did stop the whole show and the audience soon grew tired of waiting. Go on with the play, go on with the play right now, or we want our money back. But it was all but wasted breath as the marionettes carried Pinocchio on their shoulders. Yes, very happily they were all dancing across the stage, then out came the showman. He was so very big and ugly that the sight of him was enough to frighten anyone. His beard was as black as ink and so long that it reached from his chin to the ground. His mouth was big and very loud, his eyes like two lanterns with fire burning in them. In his large heavy hand he carried a long bull whip that he cracked as he walked about. As soon as he came in, there was nothing but dead silence, one could hear a pin drop. The poor marionettes trembled like so many leaves, the audience gasped in horror. You, why have you come to stop the play, I have had enough. The big man, who smelled quite and very badly, went directly to poor little Pinocchio. He was shaking with fright like a very cold winter's windy chill, as the man towered over him. Believe me sir, it was not at all my fault, you see I was on my way to school. You stop, do not say another word, tonight we will settle this matter, I will have your head. All the marionettes went back to their places and yes, the show must always go on. When the play was over the man went to the kitchen, where a sheep was roasting for supper. There was not enough wood to roast it, so he called Harlequin and Punchinello to him. The two marionettes froze in their tracks at what the ugly man commanded of them. Bring that marionette here, you will find him hanging on a nail, he is made of dried wood. If I throw him into the fire it will make a fine blaze for my dinner roast. The showman looked so severely at them they had no choice but to find poor Pinocchio. When they returned he was wiggling like a meal out of water, screaming at the top of his voice. Papa, oh papa, save me, I will not die, I will not die, he is going to kill me. Fire Eater pardons Pinocchio. The showman's name was Fire Eater, he looked like a terrible man, but he had a big heart. When he heard poor Pinocchio cry out for his father he felt sorry for him, this was a start. Are your mama and papa still alive? I heard you crying to them. Yes, that is my papa, is, I never had any mama. Fire Eater held Pinocchio up by his neck with one hand, quite high into the air. The poor man, I pity him, who can say how sorry he would be, if I should throw you into those burning coals. So, I shall pardon you, yes, tonight I shall have to eat my mutton half cooked. But the next time you fall into my hands, or mess up my theater, beware. Pinocchio was allowed to stay overnight with the other marionettes, they rested in a wagon. The next morning Fire Eater sent Punchinello peacefully out to find him for a meeting. What is your father's name? My papa's name is Geppetto, sir. 
What does this Gippetto do for a living? He is but a beggar, sir, but he is skilled. Oh, a beggar, eh? Does he get much money? No, he never has a penny in his pocket. He had to sell the only coat he had to me a spelling book so I could go to school. I sold the book yesterday for three cents just so I could see the show. Oh, how I wish I had gone to school. Fire Eater listened to Pinocchio and seemed to look kindly to him. The poor fellow, I feel sorry for him. Here are five gold pieces, leave at once and take them right to him. Pinocchio thanked the showman a thousand times and did go down before him. He said goodbye to the other marionettes, then he set out to his papa and home again. The fox and the cat. He had not traveled very far before he met a lame fox and a cat, quite blind in both eyes. The fox, lamed in one foot, leaned on the cat who was blind, who was led by the fox. Good day Pinocchio. The fox seemed to know him. Fox, how do you happen to know my name? Oh, I know your father well. Just where did you see him? I saw him yesterday at the door of his house. He had no coat and was shivering with the cold. Oh, my poor papa, but all that will soon be over. He will shiver no more. Why, just why will he shiver no more? Because I have become a gentleman. The fox laughed. The cat, too, laughed but she combed her whiskers so he could not see her. There is nothing to laugh at, you can see for yourselves that here are five gold pieces. As the gold rang in his fingers the sly fox put out the paw that was to be so lame. The cat opened both eyes which were but green, but she shut them quickly as to not be seen. And now just, what will you do with all of that money? First of all I will buy a new coat for my papa, then a spelling book for myself. A spelling book for yourself, Geppetto said you had one. I did a business deal, yes indeed, I intend to go to school and study. Look at me and I'm a sly fox, because I wished to study I had lost a leg. The cat also spoke to Pinocchio. Look at me, because I wish to study, meow, meow, I have lost the sight of my eyes. At that very moment a black bird that sat on the hedge beside the road began to sing. Pinocchio, claw, claw, do not listen to what bad companions tell you, if you do you will be sorry, claw, claw. But oh the poor little black bird, it would have been well for him to not have spoken. For the cat grew annoyed and did spring upon him, devouring him in but one mouthful. Poor blackbird, why did you treat him so badly? The cat licked her paws clean and explained that it was more than hunger. I did it to teach him a lesson, meow, he will know not to meddle in the affairs of others. Pinocchio did not like what he witnessed, but lingered and the fox did smile, slyly. Should you like to double your money? Better yet, would you like to turn your five gold pieces into a hundred or maybe even a thousand? I think so, but in what way? The fox licked his lips and shook his lame paw. The way is easy, instead of going home, you must go with us to the land of the owls. Pinocchio thought curiously for a few moments. No, I will not go with you, I must go home to my papa. Who knows how badly he felt yesterday, when I did not return. I have been a bad boy again. The talking cricket was right, when he said, Woe to those boys who disobey their parents and run away from home. Why only yesterday I almost lost my life in Fire Eater's house. No, I will be happier with five pieces. Well, go home then and so much the worse, for you, just between you and me. 
Between today and tomorrow your five gold pieces would probably become a thousand. The Lame Fox and the No Good Cat mocked little Pinocchio. Yes, meow, meow, so much the worse. Just how could they become quite so many in such a short time? I will tell you, in the land of the owls, there is a place called the Field of Wonders. If you plant one gold piece in that field and water it with two pails of water, it will begin to grow. Then you must go to bed and sleep until the next morning. The very next day you will find a beautiful tree with as many gold pieces on it as there are leaves on a cherry tree. When Pinocchio heard this his nose grew, he forgot about Geppetto and his new wool coat. He also forgot all about his spelling book, the promise to go to school, he was now fooled. Come let us start at once, where is this field of wonders? I will go with you, right now. The Grey Goose Inn. The three started down the road, walking, until they came to the Grey Goose Inn. Arriving there, there they all went in to rest and have something fitting for dinner. It is, is almost night and we are very tired, let's stop and rest until midnight. So that we may reach the Field of Wonders tomorrow morning at sunrise. The fox ate a rabbit and some fat chickens, the cat nothing but fish, Pinocchio ate little. He ordered some walnuts and a piece of bread but the Field of Wonders filled his head. After supper the three companions went to bed, the innkeeper would wake them at midnight. The cat and the fox slept in one room and Pinocchio in another, both away from the other. Pinocchio soon fell asleep dreaming he was in a field full of trees covered in gold pieces. Just as he was about to reach out and pick them the innkeeper knocked to awaken him. Are the others ready? Ready and gone, they left two hours ago. Oh, why were they in such a big hurry? The cat heard that her oldest kitten had frozen its feet and feared it might be dying. Oh no, that is sad, did they pay for their supper? No, certainly not, they said they did not want to hurt your feelings by paying for it. Where did they say they would meet me? They said they would meet you at the Field of Wonders in the morning. Pinocchio sighed, then paid a gold piece for the dinner and rooms, then he set out alone. It was very dark, he could not see the road, but stumbled along not knowing where he was. Some night birds flew across the road crushing his long nose with their wings as they passed. They really frightened him and he sobbed a little, shaking too, as it was quite cold outside. What was that, who goes there? He heard nothing and really grew very afraid, but walked along the creepy dark road. Just ahead he saw something shimmering, yes, shining like a small lamp on a dead tree. Who are you, a lightning bug? A very faint voice whispered like the wind to him. I am the ghost of the talking cricket, Pinocchio. Oh no, now what do you want? I want to give you some good advice, go back and take the four gold pieces to your poor father, who is very sad because you did not come back home two days ago. No, you don't understand, by tomorrow my papa will be a rich gentleman. These four gold pieces will be a thousand, I'm going to the field of wonders to plant them. My boy, do not believe those evildoers who promise to make you rich in one day. They are treacherous rogues, you must listen to me and go right home. No, I shall not go back, I made up my mind to go on. Oh, but the hour is late, go home now. I have decided to go on. The night is dark and very evil, go home. I have decided to go on. The road ahead is very dangerous, go home. I have decided to go on. 
remember that boys who will have their own way sooner or later are sorry for it. Good night little Pinocchio, I hope your papa does not die from a broken heart. May you be saved from the assassins, beware of the assassins, beware Pinocchio. As soon as the ghost of the talking cricket had said this he disappeared, it became very dark. It was darker than the pitch black of all nights, then a nearby wind whistled through the trees. There was the sound of rolling thunder in the far distance and the flash of boat lightning. The road became darker than ever, as Pinocchio went ahead, it really became very frightening. The Assassins Boys ought to be pitied, everyone scolds us and tells us what to do. The talking cricket that was dead comes back and tells me to beware of the Assassins. I do not believe in assassins, I have never, ever believed in them. I think our papas make up stories about them to scare little boys to keep them from going out after dark. If I were to meet assassins on this road do you think they would scare me? No, not the least in this world, if I were to meet assassins I would say, assassins, what do you want of me? Remember there is no joking with me, go away now, if you know what is good for you. Quote. They would be afraid of me and went away home to their wicked mothers. He had hardly finished saying this when he heard the rustle of trees and bushes behind him. When he turned to him to see two objects wrapped in black cloaks running fast now after him. He did not know where to hide his gold pieces so he put them in his mouth, under his tongue. He started to escape but was caught up by the two in moments, they held him by his arms. Your money or your life little man. Pinocchio could not speak, but shrugged his shoulders, as if to show he was quite penniless. Come now, let us have no nonsense, give up your money or you will die. The taller of the assassins added more threats to frighten little Pinocchio. After we kill and burn you, we will find and kill your father. No, no not my poor papa. Pinocchio could not help but speak in defense of Geppetto, the coins rattled in his mouth. Oh, you little rascal, you have hidden the money in your mouth. You tried to pull a fast one on us and now you will pay for lying and making a fool of us. The shorter assassin drew out a long knife and with it tried to force Pinocchio's mouth open. But brave Pinocchio, as quick as a wink, bit off the assassin's hand and it fell to the ground. Surprised was he to see that it was not even the hand that fell but only the front paw of a cat. He broke free and jumped a hedge and began to run quickly through the dark, wet fields. The one with no paw ran on three legs, but they chased him quite like dogs after a rabbit. After a race of several miles he could run no further so he climbed to the top of a tall pine tree. The assassins tried to climb up after him, but fell back down after only going up halfway. They gathered some dry wood and it set fire to that tree and it began to burn like a candle. The fire came nearer and nearer to him so he leaped from the top and hit the ground running. The assassins followed in hot pursuit as the whole forest now started on fire behind them. When daybreak came they were still chasing after him, quite determined to get that gold. Pinocchio came to a wide, fast stream, he knew he could jump it and sprang over the whole thing. The would-be assassins also jumped, but splish and splash they fell right in and deep first. They splashed around quite angry and very wet, the fox helped the cat who did not like water. 
Yes, you both are very dirty and needed a fine bath, assassins. He thought they would be drowned, but both got ashore and took right off back after him. Pinocchio's courage was leaving him, but he saw not far away a small house as white as snow. Oh, if only I can reach that house, maybe I will be saved. He soon reached that house and began to knock as loudly as he could upon the front door. He knocked again and again, but nobody answered there was no time to lose, they drew near. Seeing that knocking was useless he began to kick the door with all his might and strength. A window opened and a beautiful fairy with blue hair and a face as white as snow did appear. He started to speak to her, but noticed her eyes were closed and knew she could not see him. He heard heavy breathing, then was seized by his neck and the same terrible voices shouting. You shall not escape us again. When he saw that he trembled so that his legs shook and the gold rattled in his mouth. He was terrified when they drew out the two long knives and tried to stab him to death. Now then, you will give us the gold and we are going to cut you into toothpicks. Geppetto made Pinocchio from a very special piece of wood, they stabbed and stabbed him. But the long blades of the knives only began to break apart then fall into a thousand pieces. I know what we shall do, let's hang him from that tree right over there. They found a long rope near the little house and it hanged Pinocchio from a tall oak tree. Then sat back on the grass and just waited for him to show, but three hours later, he lived. Well, well, there is still life in the little fellow, we will see you here tomorrow Pinocchio. The three-legged cat added her nasty remarks as well. Meow, goodbye until tomorrow. Meow, meow, let us hope you will be kind enough to die with your mouth open. You bit off my paw, meow and I do not like that at all. Then they went away, little by little his eyes grew dim, he hoped that someone would come. At last his breath was failing him, he shut his eyes, opened his mouth and hummed, as if now dead. Pinocchio is saved by the fairy with blue hair. The beautiful fairy with long blue hair looked out the window and saw him hanging there. She sent a great dog to go rescue him, as she felt much sorrow for poor little Pinocchio. As soon as the dog returned, she took his limp body in her arms placing him into a fine bed. She covered him with warm blankets and fluffed up two beautiful silken pillows for his head. Then she sent immediately for three very famous doctors who came to her all at once. One was good Dr. Crow, secondly was wise Dr. Owl, thirdly Dr. Talking Cricket. Doctors, I wish to know if this marionette is still alive or is now dead. When she requested this Dr. Crow felt Pinocchio's pulse, then his nose and then his toes. I think perhaps the marionette is quite dead. If he is not dead, it is a sign that he is still very much alive and he did survive. Wise Dr. Rao peered over his patient looking quite discreetly, listening for any breath. In my opinion, the marionette is still quite alive, but if he is not alive, then he is surely dead. The beautiful fairy, who was enchanting in every way, peered sorrowfully to Dr. Cricket. In my opinion, the wisest thing for a doctor to do when he does not know what he is talking about, is to be quite silent. This marionette has a face that is not new to me at all. For I have known him for some time now. Up to this time little Pinocchio had been lying there as still as if he were really quite dead. But only now did he start to tremble so very much that he began to shake the beautiful bed. 
that little marionette, there is a me, little wooden-headed, bad boy, rogue. Then Pinocchio opened his little eyes, blinked for a fleeting moment and only quickly. He is nothing less than a good for nothing little when away. With that remark he hid his wooden head under the silken bed covers which changed colors. What's more, that marionette is a very bad boy who will make his poor father die of a broken heart. His story it is a very, very sad tale that I only wish I would never, ever have to start. With this, all that once sobbing and crying was heard from well under the magic bed covers. The very beautiful and enchanted, now enlightened, fairy was smiling and her gown sparkled. Good Dr. Crow was pleased to no end. When a dead person cries it is a sign that he, truly, will get well. Wise Dr. Rao bowed his head and folded his hands. I do not disagree with you, but when a dead person cries, it is a sign that he is sorry to die. Pinocchio refuses the medicine. The three fine doctors bowed before the beautiful fairy, as if she were their queen, then left. She placed her hand upon Pinocchio's forehead and found it hot, she knew he had a fever. She prepared a potion that she would feed him three times a day, yes, every eight hours. Pinocchio knew already that he would rather not take any medicine, for it always tasted sour. I am going to give you this mixed with a little water, it will help make your fever go away. Pinocchio looked at the glass and his face grew up scornfully, in fear of the taste. Is it bitter or is it sweet? Medicine always tastes just like it smells, just terribly awful. It is a little bitter, just hold your nose and drink, in a few days you will be cured. Oh no, if it is bitter, it is simple I just will not take it. Drink it and I will give you a lump of sugar just to take away the bad taste. Give me the lump of sugar first, then I will drink the medicine. The beautiful fairy cheerfully plucked a lump from a sugar bowl and gave it to him. Pinocchio took it in his fingers and tasted it before he let it melt down in his mouth. Now, Pinocchio, you must keep your promise and drink down this medicine. He took up the glass and held it to the light, then smelled it, but placed it back on the table. It's too bitter and it smells fishy, I cannot possibly drink it. How can you say that, you haven't even tasted it? You promised me to. Pinocchio, you must learn to keep your promises. I know it from the smell, I would rather die than taste that medicine. There was a soft knocking at the door, the fairy opened it and four black rabbits came in. They were quite large nice looking rabbits, they were carrying a hammock tied to long poles. What do you want? He was really frightened and disturbed about these creatures. We now have come for you, we must get you in this hammock, up, out of bed with you. You have come for me? Why, I'm not even dead, I'm well. No, not yet, but you have only a few minutes to live. You have refused the medicine that would have cured you. Now, you must get out of bed, are you too weak? Oh fairy, my beautiful fairy princess, give me the medicine, I will not die. I will drink it all now, give me the medicine please. So he took the glass and drank it all in one gulp, he turned around and the rabbits were gone. In a few minutes he became well, Pinocchio is made of wood and may be cured very quickly. It seemed like the room lit up in stardust and beautiful, colorful magic, he danced all around. The fairy was quite delighted with the potion that she and the doctors had prepared for him. Well you are feeling much better now, that is good Pinocchio.
Indeed, I should think so. The medicine has saved my life. Then why did you have to be coaxed so much to take it? It is this way, we boys are more afraid of medicine than of being ill. Pinocchio told the fairy all that had happened to him since he left home to go to school. She listened very carefully about the marionettes, Fire Eater, the Fox and the Cat, the Assassins. He thanked her for saving him from death on the big oak and said he would love her forever. He kissed her hand and there was colorful stardust all around them for only a few moments. I love you also, if you will stay here you will be my little brother and I your little sister. I should like like to stay but I must go home to be with my papa. Just what happened to the four gold pieces, do you still have them? Oh no, I have lost them, maybe in the forest. Pinocchio lied, he had all four gold pieces in his pocket, his nose grew two inches longer. If you lost them in the forest, we shall go and find them. I remember now, I did not lose them in the forest, I swallowed them with the medicine. As soon as he told this lie, his nose grew so long that it touched the wall and he couldn't move. How foolish you are to tell lies, especially to me, I'm your very best friend. Pinocchio began to cry and he cried a long time, she let him, he could not move one inch. When she felt he had enough, she opened a window and a hundred woodpeckers fixed him. I have sent for your father, he will be here to get you tonight. Really, is it true? Then, if you are willing, I would like to go out and meet him. Well, I cannot stop you, go then, but be careful not to get lost. Take the road that passes through the woods, I'm sure you will meet with him there. Pinocchio cheerfully thanked her again and immediately set out running through the woods. He stopped when he got to the big oak tree, when he did there was a noise from bushes there. He began to look into them to see who or what it was making all that commotion. When he started to pass the branches out came the fox and his friend, a three-pawed cat. Why, if it isn't our dear friend Pinocchio, how do you happen to be here? It is a very long story, but do you know, that assassins attacked and tried to kill me? Assassins, oh my, and what did they want with you? They wanted to rob me of my gold pieces, but the fairy saved my life. Meow, oh the villains, Meow wasn't that terrible. The fox and the cat acted nice and touched Pinocchio on the shoulder. Where are you going now? May we walk with you? My papa is coming tonight to get me. He will be along any time now. But what have you done with the gold pieces? I still have four of them right here in my pocket. I spent one at the Grey Goose Inn. Meow, meow, and to think that instead of four pieces they might now be four thousand. Well, it's not too late, let's go plant those four pieces in the field of wonders now, today. I cannot go today. Why not? Tomorrow would be too late. Why would it be too late? The field of wonders has been sold to a man that will not allow any gold planted thereafter today. Oh my, how far is the field of wonders from this place? Not two miles, as the crow flies, you can plant your gold and even watch it grow. Then fill your pockets, will you come with us, we can be there in one half hour. Pinocchio thought about the good fairy, then his father, he remembered the talking cricket. He turned, waited a little, while before answering, but had only a wooden head and no sense. Yes. I will go with you, why not? The more gold the better. The fox rubbed both his front paws together gleefully and the cat licked herself clean. 
the three set out and walked a half day, much longer than the half hour that the fox said. They walked on, saying nothing, until they reached a town called Trap for Blockhead. They entered, he saw streets full of dogs who lost their coats and were dying from hunger. Just where is the field of wonders? Pinocchio grew ever more curious, as he saw sheep who sold their wool and were shivering cold. There were hens and roosters who had run away from home and were begging them for corn. It is right over that way, just a step from here. They were soon outside of town and came to a field, it looked like any dry field. Pinocchio, I present to you the magical field of wonders. Just stoop down and dig a little hole in the ground and plant your gold deep in it. Pinocchio did, just as the fox told him, digging a hole about a foot deep using his hands. He planted the four remaining gold pieces, then covered them over with the pile of sand. Now then, go to the canal and bring a pail of water, then wet the ground, where you planted. Should I not mark this place with the stone? Meow, meow, just get the water Pinocchio, get it now, meow. Pinocchio did, as told and went to the canal, he had no pail so he filled his shoes with water. He walked back being careful not to spill a drop, returning, he poured the water on the spot. Is there anything else to be done, how long should I wait? No, nothing else at all, we can all go away now. You can come back in a few minutes and we'll find a tiny shrub with its branches filled with small gold coins. The longer you let it grow the more coins there will be and there will be many. They had seen Pinocchio water his seeds and wished him a good harvest, then went away. Pinocchio is robbed of his gold and is sent to prison. Pinocchio eagerly left the field of wonders and returned to town, counting the minutes. He grew very impatient and paced the walk back and forth, he decided to return to the field. As he skipped along, he could hear his heart beat tick-tack, tick-tock, like a clock, his mind reeled. He was growing very eager, knowing what joy this would bring his father, when he went home. What, if I should find two thousand gold pieces instead of one thousand? Oh, what, if there are five thousand instead of just two thousand? What a fine gentleman I should be then. Yes, I should have a fine, very large house full of cakes and candy all the time. Pinocchio began to look for a small tree with its branches full of money, he saw nothing. Then he found the exact same spot where he planted the gold, but there was still nothing. He looked around thinking that was maybe the wrong place, he searched all the field over. There was such a sorrowful look on his face, then he heard what sounded like someone laughing. Who is laughing at me, where are you? He gazed about the field and then saw a large parrot smoothing his feathers in a tree. You there parrot, why are you laughing at me? I am laughing because I was smoothing my feathers, I tickled myself under my wing. Pinocchio said nothing, he went back to the canal and filled his shoes with water once again. He returned to the very spot and wet the ground very carefully, the parrot laughed loudly. You ill-mannered parrot, will you please tell me what you are laughing at? I believe, as simpletons, who do believe all the foolish things that are told them. What, are you speaking of me parrot? Yes, I'm speaking of you, if you are simple enough to believe that gold could be planted. Then gathered in the same way as flowers, beans or corn. I don't understand you, I planted gold, not flowers, beans or any corn. 
Besides, this is the great field of wonders. Listen to me, there is no such place as the field of wonders. While you were in town, the fox and the cat returned to the field and dug up. Then took your gold, they fled like the very wind itself. He that catches up with them now, might need be very clever. Pinocchio stood with his mouth open, staring madly at the colorful parrot, not believing her. He began to dig, where he planted the gold, he dug and dug again, but whoa, the coins were gone. When he realized what a perfect fool he had become, he ran directly back to that dirty town. He went to court with the judge and alleged his complaint about the fox, the cat and the gold. The judge did listen honorably to the poor little victim's sad story, then he rested his case. The judge looked around the courtroom at all who were seated there, tapping his gavel twice. Officers, this poor marionette has clearly been robbed of all his wealth and trust. The court finds him guilty, as charged, take him directly to prison. Where he will remain for life with no possible chance for parole. Pinocchio was surprised that he could not say a word to save himself from this unjust sentence. He hit and fought all he could, but went directly to state prison, where he would remain. Well, two, three, four months did pass before the king came to town and granted all amnesty. All those in prison would now be set free, including poor, disillusioned, bewildered Pinocchio. Pinocchio is caught in a trap. One can only imagine Pinocchio's joy, when he finally was set free, he left town in an instant. To find the road back to the good fairy's home, where he would be treated to love and care. Because of heavy rainy weather the road was like a marsh, he sank up to his knees in mire. He splashed himself from head to foot, but would not give up making his way slowly, but surely. He had hoped to reach the fairy's house before nightfall came, but also grew quite hungry. He saw some grapes off the road and behind the hedge deciding he might go gather them. But he wished he had never saw them, he hardly reached the vines when his legs were caught. A very large trap snapped just catching him, it hurt so much, as stars danced before his eyes. He had been caught in a trap that a farmer had set to catch a thief who had stole his chickens. Pinocchio surely felt dizzy, he cried and screamed for help with not a person to hear him. Then night came on and he was in extreme pain when a fire glided past quite near to him. It flew about poor Pinocchio's head, it went around and around him again, he called to it. Oh little firefly, will you please have pity on me and free me from this trap? Poor boy, how did you happen to get caught up in all these irons anyway? I was very hungry and I came into this field to gather some of these grapes. Were these your grapes to gather? No, usually I would not do such a thing, but I was really quite hungry. Hunger is not enough reason to steal someone else's fruit. I know it now, I shall never, ever do it again. They heard the sound of someone coming and the firefly flickered in and fled away. It was the farmer coming to see if a weasel that stole his chickens may have been caught. He took his lantern from under his coat now quite surprised to see he had caught a boy instead. Pinocchio did not know now really what to say, he was in great pain, but also in much trouble. You little thief, so it was you not the weasels who have been running off with my chickens. No, it was not I, indeed it was not, you must believe me, I was hungry and saw those grapes. He who steals my grapes may as well be stealing my chickens. Now I shall give you a lesson that you will not forget at least in any time soon. 
Then the farmer opened the trap, took him by the neck and carried him, as if he were a lamb. Reaching the yard in front of his home, he threw him on the ground with his boot at his throat. I am very tired, we shall settle this matter tomorrow, my watchdog died this morning. Yes, you shall take his place, you shall be my watchdog, stay, do not move. The farmer took up a heavy dog collar covered with spikes and placed it around his neck. It was tight and would not come off, there was a heavy chain that held him fast to the wall. If it should rain you may go lie down in the kennel. There is a straw bed where the dog used to sleep, it will serve well as a bed for the likes of you. If robbers should come, keep your ears open and bark like a dog, so that I might hear you. After saying this the mean farmer went into his house and shut the door, as he was quite tired. Poor Pinocchio lay on the ground more dead than alive from the cold, his hunger and fear. He lay there for some time trying to loosen himself from the collar at his throat so tightly. After a while he just gave up trying and went into the kennel, falling fast asleep on the straw. Pinocchio discovers the robbers. Pinocchio had been asleep for nearly two hours, before he was awakened by whispering. He pointed his nose out of the kennel door and saw four little black furry beasts together. They looked very much like cats, but no, they were black weasels whispering to each other. It seems they were trying to decide which one would go to the kennel door and speak to him. Good evening Milampo. Excuse me but my name is not Milampo, I'm Pinocchio. The weasel that came forward was now very confused over this dilemma. Well what are you doing here, where is the dog who lives here? He died yesterday morning, I'm the acting watchdog. Is he dead? That poor dog he was so good, I judge that you are a good dog as well. I beg your pardon, I'm clearly not a dog at all, I'm a marionette. I have never heard of a marionette dog before. If you are good we will offer you the same terms, as we offered Milampo. I'm sure you will be pleased with them. Don't be so sure, the farmer is mean and might kill me, what are your terms? One night every week you are to permit us to visit the hen house, see? We will carry off eight chickens, seven will be eaten by us and one will be given to you. All you need to do is pretend to be asleep and you must never, ever bark to awaken the farmer. So do we have a deal my little marionette dog, do we chum? Did Milampo do that? Certainly, we were always on the best of terms with him. Sleep quietly now, and before we go we will leave a fine chicken beside the kennel for your breakfast. Thinking it was safe the weasels went to the chicken yard, they opened the gate and entered. Now no sooner did they all sneak in, when they heard the gate shut behind them with a click. It was Pinocchio who had closed it, he also put a large stone up against it to force it shut. Then he did begin to bark loudly just like a big dog knowing this would please the farmer. Bow wow, bow wow, ruff ruff, bow wow. The farmer was aroused by the barking and threw open a window. What is going on out there? What is the matter? The robbers have come farmer, I have them captured. In a few moments the farmer was after the four weasels with the big shotgun in his hand. Pinocchio covered his ears and shut his eyes, but the farmer caught them in a burlap bag. How did you manage to discover these four? My dog Milampo never heard a thing. Pinocchio thought to himself for a few moments, gazing at the ground, then the night sky. Milampo was a good watchdog too. When the thieves came into the yard were you asleep or awake? 
I was asleep. They woke me with all their chatter. They offered me one chicken if I let them take seven. Oh, they dare to make such an offer. I did not eat yesterday at all, but will never be guilty of sharing in the games of thieves. After what I went through, I wish that on no one. My, my, that was very well said my good boy. In proof of my gratitude I will give you some food and you will be allowed to go free. You may go to your home, you did your job very well. The farmer undid the heavy dog collar and gave Pinocchio a sack of food for his journey. Pinocchio goes to find the fairy and his father. Pinocchio was delighted knowing that he had said and done the right thing for a change. He ran across the fields and leaped over fallen trees and did not stop until he found the road. He followed along until he came to the edge of the valley. He saw the woods and the big oak. He remembered where he met the fox and the cat, but he could not see the fairy's home. Suddenly he began to run, leaping down the tall edges of the valley and through the woods. He was breathing heavily and felt anxious to find the beautiful fairy who had saved his life. He ran past the big oak and found only the foundation where the white house once stood. In the center of the foundation there was a fine marble slab on which these words were cut. Here lies the fairy with the blue hair, who died from sorrow, because she lost her little brother Pinocchio. One can only imagine Pinocchio's feelings when he spelled out these very, very sad words. He burst into tears, fell on the ground by the grave, he cried all night and into the morning. Oh beautiful little fairy queen, why did you have to die? Why didn't I die instead of you, for I'm so wicked and you are so wonderfully good. In his grief he tried to tear out his hair, but it was made of wood and he could not do it. Soon he dried his eyes, went in search of her, for he could not believe she was really dead. He had traveled for many miles, until he came to a seashore all lined with very many people. They were looking out on the very choppy water, shouting loudly and waving their arms. What has happened? Has the ship sunk? A poor father who has lost his only son has gone out in a boat to search for him. The sea is so rough that the small boat is in danger of sinking. Oh my, where is the little boat? Pinocchio put his hand over his eyes to block the sun glare and gazed out over the wavy water. It was so small and far away it looked like a tiny, little nutshell with a toy man inside of it. It's my papa, that is my papa out there, he is looking for me. Now a great wave could be seen coming from the far distance heading right to Geppetto's boat. The people covered their eyes, as they could nothing to stop this wave, the boat disappeared. The poor man. The fisherman turned and began to walk home, knowing certain death by drowning occurred. Just then they heard a shout and saw a little boy jump from a rock and leap right into the sea. I will save my papa. Being made of wood, Pinocchio floated well and he swam like a fish, his little arms treading. At one moment they saw him go under a wave, then he would appear again, until he did not. Poor boy, may they both rest in peace, in Davy Jones' locker. Pinocchio reaches the island of the industrious bees. Pinocchio hoped to save his father, swimming all night, and what a horrible night it was. Rain fell in torrents, it hailed, thunder was awful, the lightning flashes made it seem like day. Then in the early morning he could see a long strip of land not too far away, it was an island. 
He tried to reach the shore but was tossed about like a stick or straw, but he struggled in vain. He splashed around and was held back by surf, then a large wave carried him up on the beach. He was thrown high upon the rocks and fell with such force that it nearly broke him in pieces. Oh, again I have a lucky escape. Little by little the sky cleared, the sun shined down and the sea became as smooth as glass. He put out his clothes to dry and looked out, in vain, to see if there was any sign of his papa. I wish I knew what this island is called. I should like to know if the people have the habit of hanging boys to the branches of trees. But there is nobody to ask. Being alone on the island made him so sad he began to cry, then he saw a big fish swimming. It was moving slowly with its head out of the water, not knowing its name he called out to it. Mr. Fish, oh Mr. Fish, may I have a word with you? Yes, you may have to, if you wish, but I'm only but a fish. Will you be kind enough to tell me if there are any villages on this island? I would very much like to get something to eat, hopefully without being eaten myself. Yes, there are villages, you will find one not far from here. What path must I find to get there? You must take the path on the left then follow your nose. Goodbye Mr. Fish, please excuse any trouble I have caused you, thank you. Pinocchio looked and took the path to the left, he walked very fast looking right at his nose. It was was a half hour before he reached a town called the village of the busy bees, he smiled. The streets were very full of people, running here and there, all were at work, all very busy. One could not find an idle person anywhere, if one were to search the village with the lamp. Oh no! I see, that is no place for me to be, I was not born to work like this. All this time Pinocchio was dying of hunger, he saw a man coming down the road, sweating. This man was dragging two carts quite full of charcoal behind him, Pinocchio stopped him. Please sir, will you have the kindness to spare me a halfpenny? I'm dying of hunger. You shall have not only a halfpenny, if you help me drag these, I will give you two pennies. I am surprised at you, I do not care to do the work of a donkey, I shall not draw a cart. Then, my boy, eat a big slice of your pride for your breakfast. The man continued on, followed by a mason carrying a heavy bag of lime on his shoulders. Please sir, will you have the kindness to give me a halfpenny? I'm dying of hunger. Carry the lime for me and I will give you five pennies. But the lime looks so heavy, I do not want to tire myself. Well, if you don't want to be tired, amuse yourself by being hungry and much good it may do you. In less than a half hour twenty other persons passed by, each carrying something somewhere. Pinocchio begged every one of them for a halfpenny or anything and all told him the same. Instead of begging, go and look for a little work and learn to earn your own bread. At last there came a small woman carrying two jugs of fresh water. Will you give me a drink of that water, please madam? Yes, drink, my boy, if you wish to. Pinocchio could not believe that someone finally helped him, he drank like a fish. I have cured my thirst, now I should like to have something to eat. Well, if you help me carry these two jugs of water I will feed you a fine piece of bread. Pinocchio looked somewhat annoyed and at the jugs of water but said nothing. Besides the bread you shall have some cabbage covered with oil and sugar. Pinocchio looked somewhat annoyed and at the jugs of water but said nothing. Besides the bread and the cabbage, oil and sugar, I will give you some pudding with some syrup on it. 
The reward was much too tempting for Pinocchio to resist and he agreed to do this task. Only he found the jugs much too heavy to lift so he had to carry one on top of his head. When they came to the house Pinocchio was made to wash up and to sit at a small table. Then the nice woman placed before him the meal of bread, cabbage with oil and pudding. Pinocchio did not eat this food, he devoured it, for his tummy was like a very empty house. He ate, then ate and then ate some more, until it was gone, then he stared at the nice woman. It was strange to him that she was so nice, his body felt whole again, as he stared and stared. The woman stood with her arms at her hips noticing his concern, then his jaw dropped open. What has surprised you so, my little man? Oh nothing, that is I thought you looked like someone I loved but I learned that she died. Were you ever a fairy? You see your voice is the same as hers and you have such beautiful blue hair like she did. I really do miss her very much, oh yes, I know now it is you. Pinocchio kissed her hand, he hugged her and kissed her, as if he were a little happy puppy. The little house flashed of light and the walls all changed color again and again in a moment. No, at first the little woman would not admit that she really was the fairy with the blue hair. But when she saw that he knew her and was so happy to be near her, she smiled quite upon him. Here, here you little rogue, just how do you happen to know me? It was my great love for you that told me I knew you could not be dead. Yes, but when you saw me last I was but a child, I have grown until I'm almost a woman. But how do you manage to grow older so fast? That is a secret. Can you teach this to me? I'm always no bigger than a tenpin. But you cannot grow, marionettes can never grow. They are born marionettes, they live marionettes and they shall die marionettes. That is, how it is, and how it shall forever be. You see, I'm tired of being just another marionette, I should like to be a real boy. Well, it is rare, but you may become one, only, when you are deserving enough. Oh my, what can I do to deserve it? Whatever it is I must do, I will do. It is really very easy, but that is, why it is really very hard. You see you only have to learn to be good, it is really very simple. Is that all? I promise you, that I will begin today. Yes, I shall try to care for my dear papa. That is, if I can find him, where is my papa? I do not know. Will I should ever see him again? I think so, yes, I'm quite sure you will, if you are good. When Pinocchio heard this now he was wild with joy, he began to kiss the fairy's hand. The home filled with stardust and the rooms all flushed in many bright colors, in a moment. Dear fairy is it not true that you were dead? No, it seems that is not true. How glad I am that you are alive, how I do love you. You were very sad when you thought I was dead, so now I know you have a good heart. When boys have good hearts there is always hope for them, even if they have bad habits. That is why I came to care for you. Pinocchio clapped his hands together and jumped for joy, the fairy did then advise him. Then you must obey me and do everything I ask of you, without fail. I should always do that, yes? Tomorrow morning you will go to school. I think it is too late for me to go to school now. Why is it too late? Because it tires me so to work. My boy listen to me and listen well, those who talk in that way almost always end up in jail or in a hospital. Some boys are born rich and some are born poor, but all have to work. 
Woe to those who lead Ida lives, as Ida Miss is a dreadful illness and must be cured in childhood. If it is not cured then, it may never be cured. Pinocchio felt very much shame and guilt, for he knew he was really quite lazy. As you say, I will study, I will work, I will do anything you wish, so that I may become a good boy. Pinocchio goes to school. The very next day Pinocchio went right to school, all the boys roared with laughter at him. He, a simple marionette, made him an easy target for pranksters, when took his cap and ran. For a time he pretended not to care, when pulled his jacket and he lost his patience, sighing. He turned to the lot of the bad boys, as if he were a soldier, standing tall and sure, pointing. Be very careful boys. I did not come here to be made fun of, it is simple. I do not annoy you and you shall not annoy me. Oh yeah? Hear this poster. The boy tried to reach and grab at Pinocchio's long wooden nose, he dodged the attack truly. As quick as a wink he moved like lightning and kicked the bad boy hard knock on his shin. Ouch! Oh what hard feet! The bad boy cried in pain, as another failed trying to trip Pinocchio and make him fall. Ouch! Oh no, his hands are much harder than his feet. All boys like a boy who does not let others bully or abuse him, they learn respect for him. The teacher also liked him, for he always studied his lessons, he was first to come, last to leave. He never missed a day, but he did have one fault that worked against him, he made many friends. Some were good, but some were bad boys, those who hated to study and were mischievous. These bad boys and he drew the attention and troubled the teacher and even the good fairy. The teacher warned him every day and the good fairy made it very clear to him to be careful. Take care Pinocchio, those bad schoolmates of yours are not your friends at all. They will harm you, you must always do your best to be very good. Pinocchio goes to see the dogfish. One morning, on his way to school he met some of the bad boys who had plans for him. Pinocchio have you heard the news? Oh, what news? In the senior year they sighted a huge dogfish as big as a mountain. We are all going to see it, come with us. Oh no, no, I must go to school. You can skip one day and go back to school tomorrow, one day's lessons make no difference. But what will the teacher say? He will tell the good fairy. The teacher may say what he likes, he is paid to find fault in us. What will the fairy say? She warned me not to listen to you. She will never know it. No, what I will do is go see the dogfish after school is out. Poor donkey, do you suppose the dogfish will wait for you to come? He soon will get tired of being here and will go some other place, then it will be too late to see him. How long will it take to go to the shore? We can go there and be back inside of an hour, come with us. Well okay, may the one who runs the fastest be the best. When Pinocchio said this all the boys rushed off across the fields racing with books in hand. He was always well ahead of the other boys it seemed, as if he had wings on his feet, he ran. However, when they all finally reached the beach the sea was like a smooth mirror or glass. There were no people along the shoreline, there also was no such thing as a giant dogfish. Where is the dogfish? He must have gone to breakfast. No, I think he is taking a nap. The bad boys took turns teasing Pinocchio and he did not like being made a fool of one bit. He turned away from them gazing across the sea for a few moments, on a flat rock he did sit. Why did you tell me this lie about the stupid dogfish? I shall throw you all in the water. 
Oh, it was great when Pinocchio, you are just a do anyway. In what way was that so fun? We made you come with us and miss school. You are never, ever tardy. You ought to be ashamed, because you study so hard. I must study, I made a promise, why would have me not study, it makes no good sense. Because boys who study hard, make those who do not look bad. Then what must I do to please you? You must hate school, the lessons and the teacher, these are our three greatest enemies. You do not understand, I wish to study, the fairy has my solemn oath, I promised her. If you do, we shall have nothing more to do with you, we also shall punish you. Don't make me laugh. You better look out Pinocchio, don't have any of your big bad talk here. Remember you are only one, and there are seven of us. Yes, you are the seven wicked ones. Shut up Pinocchio, listen to him, he has insulted us now, he called us the seven wicked ones. Pinocchio you must beg our pardon or it will be the worst, for you. Cuckoo. You shall have as many blows as a donkey, we mean business. Cuckoo. You shall go home with a broken nose, apologize you wooden head. Cuckoo. I will give you a cuckoo Pinocchio, take that and keep it for your supper. As he said this, he gave Pinocchio a firm blow to his hard wooden head, it hurt his hand. It was give and take, for he fought back and returned the blow, then all the boys jumped him. Now it was seven against one but he defended himself like a true hero, he used his feet well. They were made of the hardest wood and served as his best defense, leaving large bruises. The boys were furious, they were no match for him, so they began throwing their school books. He was very quick and had sharp eyes, always ducking in time, as the books flew into the sea. The boys had no more books of their own to throw so they threw Pinocchio's books at him. When was bound in cardboard, it was aimed at Pinocchio's head, but hit another boy instead. Now, this was a direct, heavy hit on a boy's temple, he was knocked cold and fell instantly. His companions thought he was dead and all ran off as fast as their legs would carry them. Pinocchio remained and ran to the sea wet in a handkerchief, then bathed the boy's temples. The boy just lay there at full length and did not stir a muscle, nor blink an eye, as if dead. Eugene, my poor Eugene, open your eyes and look at me, I did not do this to you. Indeed, it was not I that hurt you, oh what shall I do now, they will all say I did it. What shall I do, how much better it would have been, if I had gone right to school. Why did I have to listen to you bad boys anyway? What will become of me now, what will they do to me? Then poor Pinocchio began to cry and sob, he heard the sound of footsteps coming upon him. He turned and saw two policemen coming his way and stood to greet them, then sat again. What are you two doing there on the ground? I am Pinocchio, I'm helping my schoolmate. Has he been hurt? So it seems, yes he's been hurt. Indeed he has been hurt badly, look there is a deep cut on his right temple, who did this? Not I sir. With what was he hurt? With this book sir, this book here. Pinocchio picked up the suspect weapon and handed it to the policeman carefully. To whom does this book belong? It belongs to me sir. That's all we need to know, get up and come with us at once, you are under arrest. But I'm innocent, there were seven of them against me. Come, come, you are going with us. Before they left they called to some passing fishermen nearby. This boy has been hurt, we leave him in your care, see that he is treated, we will check on him tomorrow. 
The policeman took Pinocchio by both arms and directed him to come along with them. Walk quickly boy or it will be all the worse for you. They started for the village, Pinocchio hardly knew what he was doing, like in a bad dream. His legs trembled, his tongue stuck fast in his mouth, he dared not speak in great fear. On their present path he would have to pass under the fairy's window, he would rather die. When they reached the village a gust of wind swelled up and blew his hat a good ten yards. Sir will you allow me to go get my hat please? Well go ahead, but be quick about it. Pinocchio did just that, but he did not place it back on his head, but in his teeth instead. Then he ran and ran so fast, that the policeman could not catch him, he was headed to the sea. The policeman summoned a great show dog named Bruno to chase down little Pinocchio. The town folk all came to their windows and crowded the streets to watch the big race. Pinocchio ran fast but Bruno ran much faster, they raised so much dust that it was hard to see. They raced down a long dirt road that headed right for the sea, in moments they disappeared. Pinocchio jumps into the sea. For a time Pinocchio thought he was caught, he could hear panting and could feel hot breath. If Bruno would capture him then what, they came close to the shoreline, he leaped into the sea. It was a great leap, like a big frog might do, Bruno tried to stop but he fell right into the water. The dog was so large he had a hard time staying afloat and could not swim a bit, he barked. Woof, woof, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. Drown then, if you must. Help me dear Pinocchio, save me from my death. Pinocchio did have a good heart and could not help feeling sorry for the big dog. If I save your life, will you promise not to run after me? Woof, woof, I promise, be quick for pity's sake, if you wait another minute I will go under. Pinocchio was not sure quite what to do but remembered his papa said be kind to everyone. He swam to Bruno and took hold of his tail with both hands and towed him safely to land. The poor dog could not stand, he had drank so much salt water he was like a big balloon. Pinocchio was not sure if he could trust Bruno so he jumped right back in the sea and swam. Goodbye Bruno, have a pleasant journey. Goodbye Pinocchio, thank you for saving me, if I ever have the chance I will do you a favor. Pinocchio swam on but he always kept near the land, at last he thought he reached a safe place. In among the rocks he saw a kind of cave from which appeared a large cloud of smoke rising. In that cave, there must be a fire, there I shall go dry my clothes and warm myself. He swam towards the cave and was about to climb the rocks when something lifted him up. He was high in the air, he tried to escape, but was way too late, as he was now snagged in a net. A fisherman's great net, yes as big as a barn, filled with fish of every size, kind and weight. A fisherman emerged from the cave who was so ugly that he looked like a large sea monster. All the fish fought and struggled just doing anything trying very hard to break free of the net. The fisherman pulled his net from the water, a line at a time, content with a good day's catch. What good luck, today I shall have a fine dinner of fish. Pinocchio moaned and groaned. How glad I'm to be a marionette and not a fish. The net full of fresh fish was now dragged into the cave, which was quite dark and smoky. 
In the middle of the cave there was a large frying pan and now quite full of hot, boiling oil. Now I shall see just what fish I have caught today. He would pull them out one at a time, inspect them and off they went to a table. These mullet are good, oh and a great fish, look at these sardines and excellent crabs. All the fish we gathered that day were now tossed onto a table, only Pinocchio remained. When he pulled him out of the great net, as his eyes bulged right out with astonishment. Oh? What kind of fish are you? The ugly fisherman turned Pinocchio around and around holding him up by his feet. Do you know, I believe you to be a very large lobster, yes, you are a lobster, indeed. Do you think I'm a lobster? You are blind, for I'm a wooden marionette. Oh a marionette? That is a new kind of fish to me, I shall eat you with great pleasure. Eat me? Do you intend to eat wood? I'm not a fish, I do not smell like a fish, I talk and think just like you do, fish don't talk. Well Sambu, be careful fisherman, I might eat you. Oh is that so? Because you can talk I will let you decide how you might like to be cooked. There are two choices, should you like to be fried like the other fish, or to be stewed with red and ripe tomatoes? If I'm to choose, I should like to be at my liberty, so that I should return home. You must be joking, do you think I would miss the opportunity of eating such a rare fish as you? It is not every day that marionette fish are caught in these waters. I will fry you in the frying pan with the other fish, you will be fried in good company. With this, unhappy Pinocchio began to scream, kick and beg for mercy. Oh papa, good fairy save me. How much better it would have been, if I had just gone to school. But no, I had to listen to those bad boys and now look what I get for so doing. All this time he wiggled like a meal just trying to slip out of the grip of his captor, uselessly. The fisherman then took a long piece of rope and bound both his hands and his feet together. Now he took a bag of flour and poured it all over the fish and our good friend Pinocchio too. He dipped them and into the frying pan went the base sardines, crabs, next was Pinocchio. Pinocchio is rescued from the fisherman. Just as the fisherman was about to drop Pinocchio into the fire a great dog did enter the cave. It had smelled the fish cooking and followed his nose, it was hungry and came there to now eat. Get out dog. But the big dog was hungry and did not really care just to leave, wagging his tail, as if to speak. Give me a mouthful and I will be glad to vacate. Get out of here now I tell you or I will kick you out. The fisherman then attempted to kick the big dog, who on growled and snapped his teeth. Pinocchio recognized the sound of the dog by his bark, all covered with flour he shouted out. It's Bruno, save me Bruno, he intends to fry me. He knew Pinocchio's voice, sprang ahead and took the bundle right from the fisherman's hand. Bruno then took Pinocchio and rushed out of that cave like the wind, the fisherman was angry. Alas he could do nothing to stop him and Bruno ran, and he ran, running right to the village path. The fisherman was long gone behind them, when Bruno set Pinocchio gently upon the ground. Oh Bruno, I have much to thank you for. Woof, woof, that is not needed, you saved me now I saved you. W you must all learn to help one another in this world. How did you happen to come to the cave? Woof, woof, I was lying on the shore, then I smelled the frying fish. I came as quickly as I could, woof, if I had come a second later, woof, oh no. 
Do not mention it. If you had come a second later, I would have been fried and eaten by now. Oh, it makes just shudder to think about it. Bruno and he then parted company. Pinocchio found a cottage nearby. A man greeted him. Kind sir, can you spare me some clothes? I need something to wear, to go home in. My boy, I have nothing to give you but an old bean sack. You may have that, if you like. Pinocchio did not wait to be told twice. He took the sack then he borrowed a pair of scissors. He cut a large hole in the bottom for his head and a small one on the sides for his arms. He wore it as a shirt, thanking the man and walked along the path that led to the village. He worried what the fairy would think of what he had done and if she would forgive him. When he reached the village it was late at night and very dark, rain was falling in torrents. He ran to the good fairy's home and hoped that she might let him in, then his courage fell. He could not face the fairy after all that had happened, he had broken his promise and trust. He went back a second time knocking upon her door, he waited and waited for a half hour. After knocking and knocking some more, at long last a top floor window was but opened. The house was four stories high, a snail with a lighted candle looked out and called to him. Who is there at this late hour? Oh snail, is the fairy at home please? I really should like to see her. The fairy is quite asleep and must not be awakened, but who or what are you? It is I, Pinocchio. Who is I? I am like I said, Pinocchio. And just who or what is a Pinocchio? The marionette who lives in this house. Just let me in, you will see. Oh my, yes, I understand. Wait, I'll come down to the door. Please be quick, I'm dying from the cold. I'm freezing down here. My boy, I'm but a snail and I may not or never can be in very much of a hurry. An hour long passed, then two, but still the door had not opened. Pinocchio was freezing cold. So much time passed and no one came, he trembled with fear and knocked again, but louder. With this second knock, it took quite some time, but the third story window finally opened. More time passed, before the snail peered out looking down on poor, little, cold Pinocchio. Beautiful little snail I have been waiting for two hours. Two hours on such a night, as this is two years. Now will you please come open the door? My boy, I'm but a snail and I may not or never can be in very much of a hurry. Then the window fell shut once again, the village clock struck midnight, then one, then two. The door still remained closed and Pinocchio seemed waiting in vain, he grew quite angry. This time he used the large iron knocker and in a rage, he began to reach for the hammer. But it turned into a meal, slipped out of his hands and disappeared into the water of the street. Oh that is the way it works, very well, since the knocker is gone I will kick the door down. He drew back his foot and gave the door a swift kick and his foot then went right through it. Now he could not get his foot back out of the door, one foot on the ground and for the night. He tried laying down but it did not work and he stood there, until the sunrise began to appear. The door opened and the snail had but taken nine hours from the fourth to the first floor. My boy, what are you doing with your foot stuck in the door? It was an accident, do you try, beautiful little snail, to help free my foot from the door? My boy, that is work for a carpenter, I have never been a carpenter. Please, go and ask the fairy to come. My boy, she is still quite asleep. But now do you suppose I can stay here all day stuck in this door? 
my way you can amuse yourself by counting the ants that pass down the street. At least bring me something to eat. I shall at once. Now three and a half hours passed and the snail returned with the fine silver tray on her head. Upon it was a loaf of dark bread, a very fat, roasted chicken and four nice, large, ripe apricots. My boy, here is the breakfast the fairy has sent you. His mouth watered at the sight of these good things, but when he tried to eat them it hurt. For the dark bread, the roasted chicken and the fine apricots were merely all painted plaster. He wanted to cry and was about to throw away the tray but became faint and fell down hard. When he came to, he was upon a sofa with the beautiful fairy with blue hair leaning over him. Well, Pinocchio, I will forgive you once more, but woe to you if you behave badly again. Pinocchio did promise the second time, he said he would study and do everything she said. He kept his word good for the rest of the year, so very well he stood at the head of his class. When he graduated the fairy was very much pleased with him and he did behave very well. She was so pleased that she decided to tell him something nice would soon happen to him. Tomorrow you shall have your wish come true. What wish should that be? Tomorrow you shall cease to be a wooden marionette, you shall become a real boy. One can only imagine what joy Pinocchio felt with her promise to him, it was his life's dream. It would be a most delightful day with the party to which all of his schoolmates were invited. Pinocchio invites the boys to his party. Pinocchio asks the fairy's kind permission to invite his schoolmates to his great party. Go, so, if you like and invite all your friends, but remember you must be home before dark. I promise I'll be back in an hour. Take care Pinocchio, boys are always quick to make promises. But they don't always keep their word, be sure you are home before dark. But I'm not like other boys, when I say I'll do something, I always do it. We shall see, just remember, if you disobey me, much the worse, for you. Why do you think I'll disobey you? Because, boys who not listen to those who may know more than they do, always meet with misfortune. I shall surely do, as you say, I love you. He hugged the good fairy and bade her goodbye, leaving the house singing and dancing. In less than an hour all of his friends were personally invited except for one, Candlewick. Among all of his schoolmates, was one of whom he was very fond of, Romeo was his name. He was the laziest and naughtiest boy in school and stood thin and straight like a candle. Pinocchio went to Candlewick's home to invite him but he was not there, he was on a porch. He invited Candlewick like he did the others and told him it would be a very special party. Candlewick, why are you sitting on this porch? I am just waiting here, I must start out at midnight. Where are you going? I came to invite you to my party. Very far, far, far away, Pinocchio. Don't go, I want you to come to my party. I tell you, I'm going away tonight, I won't be here for your party. Where then are you going? What town? I am going to live in the most delightful country, it is called the Land of Blockhead. You would like it there, come with me. Never. If you do not come you will be sorry, where would you find a better place for boys? There are no schools or books there, no more lessons to learn. How are the days spent in the Land of Blockhead? They are spent in fun and play from morning until night, every day. That is a life I should be glad to lead, but I don't believe it. It is true, why do you not go there with me? No, no, no and again no. 
I promised the fairy I would be a very good boy, so I shall keep my word. I must be home before dark, the sun is setting and I have to leave. Goodbye and have a pleasant journey Candlewick, I did hope you would be at my party. Inarchio stood like a gentleman to shake his friend's hand farewell. Why are you in such a hurry? Wait a little while longer and you will see the coach that is to take me to that happy country. Are you sure there are no schools that boys play all day long? There is not one school anywhere in Archeo, not one. I will wait and see you often. In the meantime night had fallen and it was quite dark, in the far distance was the light coming. It was a small light that was traveling up the road swiftly, there was the sounding of trumpets. Here it is, that is the coach. Is it really true that boys do not ever have to study in that country? Never, never, not ever, never, never. It sounds too good to be true, oh my, what a delightful country, I may go with you. Pinocchio goes to the land of the blockhead. The coach arrived, there were only the sound of voices, for its wheels were cotton padded. It was drawn by twelve pairs of donkeys, all were the same size but each a different color. These were very unusual donkeys, as they wore white shoes on their hoofs, not horseshoes. The coachman was broader than tall, with a small round face like orange, he always laughed. Tell me, my fine boy, do you intend to go to the happy country, to Blockhead? I certainly do. Candlewick did not hesitate and joined the other boys inside that coach. My dear little man, are you coming with your friend or do you remain behind? I remain behind, I'm already late for home. Well much good it may do you. Candlewick was persistent and urged Pinocchio to join him and the others in that odd coach. All the others yelled and screamed, laughing loudly, as they would at play, to get in the coach. Come with us and we shall have such fun, we will play forever. Yes, well make room for me and I shall come, it will be fun. Come now, climb aboard, if you are going I must get along now. The laughing coachman urged the marionette, Pinocchio did not hesitate another second. The door was opened and he forgot about his promise to the fairy in all the excitement. The strange mule team silently raced off down the road and rolled on throughout the night. The very next morning, just at sunrise, they were rolling past many playgrounds in Blockhead. There were teams and groups of boys most everywhere, some playing ball, others running. Some rode wooden horses, while more played hide and seek, all climbed out and joined in. In the midst of all the games and every kind of amusement, hours, days, weeks passed by. Yes, it was like lightning, they played and played some more, no school allowed in Blockhead. Oh my, what a delightful place, you were quite right Candlewick. Pinocchio has donkey ears. One morning Pinocchio awoke and he was very much surprised, he felt itching upon his head. He reached up to scratch that itch and found out that his ears grew to be about a foot long. His ears had always been small, so small it was, as if he had no ears at all, now what happened? One can only imagine his feelings when he found they had now grown to be a foot long. They felt like two grooves, he searched every room for a mirror, but none could be found. Then he filled a pail of water to look into and what he found were a pair of donkey's ears. He began to cry and carry on, roaring like a baby, the more he carried on, the longer the ears. It was quite awful, hearing these cries, a beautiful mouse that lived in the room came to him. Why are you crying, what has happened to you? 
I am in Little Mouse. I really am very ill and it scares me. Can you count my pulse? I will try. The Little Mouse climbed upon Pinocchio's arm and slid down, now, to his wrist. You do seem to have what I would call a hot and very bad fever. What kind of fever, Mouse? Tell me. You do seem to have what I would call terminal donkey fever. What is donkey fever? I have never, ever heard of that before. I will explain to you, you see in two or three hours you will not be a wooden marionette any longer. For now you will grow into a donkey, like those others who draw carts and carry cabbages to markets. Pinocchio rejected the little mouse diagnosis and tried, in vain, pulling off those long ears. Oh what shall I do now? My dear boy, there really is nothing you can do now. You see, all boys who dislike school, books and studies are those who wish to play all the time. Sooner or later they become little donkeys, yours is just sooner, not later. Oh no, this is not my fault, it's that Candlewick's fault, I should have known better. Who is this Candlewick? He is one of my friends, I wanted to stay in school and study. But he convinced me to come here with him to the great happy land of Blockhead. And play from morning until night, I told him it was too good to be true. Why did you listen to the advice of a bad boy, don't you know better? Because I'm a wooden-headed marionette with no good sense. Why did I leave the fairy who was always so kind to me? I deserve to be a donkey and I broke the second promise to be good. She warned me not to and look what has happened to me now. I must find where Candlewick is and tell him what I think of him now. Pinocchio set out to find his old friend, and when he did he saw that he had donkey ears too. They looked at one another and both laughed and laughed, laughing so hard their sides hurt. They stopped only to begin again, pointing at each other, until they could laugh no more. But all at once Candlewick could no longer stand up, he staggered around the room and fell. Help Pinocchio, something pushed me. What happened, nobody pushed you, what is wrong? It started to hit Pinocchio too, he started to stagger, as if someone pushed him down, he fell. Candlewick I cannot stand either, I think we had the terminal donkey fever. Pinocchio cried, then they began running, but they could run only on their hands and feet. As they ran their hands became hoofs, their faces that of donkeys, their backs became hairy. At last they began to grow long donkey tails, oh yes, now they tried to speak but only brave. Both now, in every way were very afraid, they continued to fill out finally standing as donkeys. Hee-haw, hee-haw, hee-haw. Then there was a very loud and hard knock, knock, knocking upon Candlewick's room door. Open the door, I'm the coachman who brought you to this place. Open the door right now, or it will be the worse for you. Pinocchio is sold. The door remained shut so the little man kicked it so hard that it flew open hitting the wall. Hee-haw, hee-haw, hee-haw. Well done boys, very well done. You brain well, I knew your voices, that is, why I'm here. He tied a rope to each of their necks and led them out of the room, then to the marketplace. Candlewick was bought by a farmer whose donkey died, Pinocchio by an animal trainer. Candlewick disappeared and poor Pinocchio lived a very hard life from that day forward. He was put into a stall and was fed straw, but he would not eat it, then hay, which he refused. This made his master very angry, so he began to use a whip on Pinocchio and beat him badly. He had not eaten for a long time and was faint from hunger so he finally gave in and ate hay. 
I will teach you not to be so picky and dainty about your food. Pinocchio thought to himself, well, inside the donkey he still could think. This hay is not bad, but how much better off I would be if I stayed with the fairy. Instead of this hay I would be eating dark bread, meat and pudding. He was sound asleep when his master aroused him the next morning. Get up at once and come with me to the circus. I shall teach you to jump through hoops and stand on your hind legs and arms. You boys came here to play, now play you shall. Poor Pinocchio, by force of love he had to learn all of these things, it took three months. His skin was whipped badly from the sting of his master's mighty whip, then came circus day. Grand performance. Tonight, there will be several acts by all the artists and the trained animals. Also the famous Little Donkey Pinocchio called the star of the dance will make his first appearance. That evening the theater was completely filled an hour before the performance was to begin. All had heard of the famous Pinocchio and had come to see him dance after the first act. Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, I have the honor of introducing to you a very celebrated little donkey. He has danced before all the kings of Europe. I present to you the great Pinocchio. This speech was received with laughter and the clapping of hands before the fanfare ended. Out pranced the talented Pinocchio to the center of the ring, dressed in tassels and ribbons. Pinocchio, before you begin to act, though before the ladies, gentlemen, and all the children, Pinocchio bent both his front knees until they touched the ground, the whip was cracked. Pinocchio, walk. He walked slowly around the ring, as ordered, the whip was cracked again. Pinocchio trot. He picked up the pace and pranced, trotting, as he was ordered, the whip cracked a third time. Pinocchio gallop. Just like a great racehorse Pinocchio raced around the ring, he always was a very good runner. The master pulled a pistol and shot it into the air and Pinocchio hit the ground to play dead. As he rose up he noticed a young, very beautiful woman with a gold chain around her neck. Now hanging from that fine gold chain was a locket, in it was a picture of a little marionette. That is my picture, that is the fairy she has come for me. He tried to cry out and stared at her, he tried as hard as he could to get her attention. Hee-haw, hee-haw, hee-haw. That is all he could say, he tried again and again. Hee-haw, hee-haw, hee-haw. Everybody laughed and thought it was part of the show, poor Pinocchio was very ashamed. He turned away for moments then turned back to see that the woman was no longer there. Now Pinocchio, let these fine folks see how well you can jump through this hoop. A hoop covered in colorful paper and ribbons was held up as he was to leap right through it. Pinocchio tried and tried and tried again but after three times he just could not seem to do it. When he made his last attempt, he fell, hitting the ground much too hard, it lamed him very badly. He limped to his stable very much in pain, the children cheered for him by name, but he never came. Bring out Pinocchio. We want Pinocchio the donkey. The next morning the animal doctor came to visit him determining he would be lame for life. The circus leader told the stable boy to tell the master of Pinocchio he would not be the same. 
What do I want with the Lame Donkey? Take him to the market and sell him. He was then led to the same market where he was sold the first time, he was sold then again. How much do you want for that lame donkey? 20 shillings. I will give you 20 cents, don't think I'm buying him to use. I'm buying him for his skin. I see his skin is very hard and I want to use it to make a drum for the band in our village. Pinocchio's heart sank when he heard that he would now eat it and turned into a drum. The man paid for 20 cents, then walked Pinocchio the donkey to the sea, very slowly. When they arrived a large, heavy stone was tied about his neck, a long rope tied to his leg. The man held the end of the rope and he was pushed into the sea, so to the bottom went he. Pinocchio is swallowed by a fish. Waiting until the donkey was good and drowned he was left under water for an hour. My poor little lame donkey must be drowned by this time. I will pull him out and make a drum of his skin, he will make a fine drum. He began to hold in the rope tied to the poor little donkey's leg, he hauled and he hauled. As the rope was pulled on to land he began to notice it was not heavy, a donkey would weigh more. Instead of a dead donkey up came a live wooden marionette, the poor man was astonished. His jaw dropped and his eyes bulged out of his head, he could not believe this, he trembled. What has happened to my little lame donkey that I threw in the water? I am the little donkey. No, donkeys do not speak. What did you do with my donkey? You are making fun of me. I am telling the truth. I would not make fun of you. You were a donkey just a short time ago. How did you become a marionette? It must have been the sea water. The ocean can make great changes. Oh no, beware marionette, beware. If you will just untie the rope I will tell you all that happened. The good man wished to hear the story and did untie the knot. Once I was a marionette, as I now, but I did not like to study and I ran away to the village of Blockhead. One day I was changed into a donkey as punishment for being bad, then I was sold to you. Yes, I pay 20 cents for you, now who will give me back my poor pennies? One word more and my story will be ended. When you threw me in the water as a donkey, the fish ate up my flesh. You might see, when you pulled up the rope, all that was left was me, Pinocchio. I spent 20 cents to buy you, I will have my money back. I will take you to the market and sell you, as firewood. Sell me, if you like, but first you will have to catch me. Pinocchio leaped into the sea and swam merrily away from the man who looked so surprised. He became very sad and watching clever Pinocchio swim quickly away, he looked on with sad eyes. Goodbye master, if you should want some dry firewood to sell, remember me. Pinocchio swam so fast that in a little, while he was out of sight from land, he saw something. Not really sure what it was he stopped swimming, it was like a sea monster with its jaws open. Pinocchio grew very frightened, as the huge dogfish closed in, he was swallowed up whole. He fell into the monster's stomach with such force that he was stunned and felt near dead. When he came to he was weak and gazed up to see his poor father, yes Geppetto, standing near. The dogfish swallowed him up the day his boat was overturned, Pinocchio was very delighted. Father here you are, listen, the dogfish is asleep, do you hear it snoring? Hurry, there is not a moment to lose, we must climb out and swim away. Oh Pinocchio it is you, how can this be? I cannot swim, you must go, go on without me. 
No, Papa, I cannot do that. Hurry, I lay up wood, you can float with me. Hurry before it wakes up. They made their way to the huge fish's gills and slipped away, jumping right into the water. Geppetto held Pinocchio close to him and paddled his legs, as they both did clean away. They were in the water for quite some time, before they spotted land, on and on they swam. When they reached the shoreline Pinocchio sprang to shore and helped Geppetto do the same. Lean on my arm, dear Papa, and let us go. We will walk very slowly like the ants, and when we grow tired we can rest by the roadside. And where shall we go, do you know, where we are? For I have not the slightest idea. We shall go to find a house, where the people will give a mouthful of bread and a little straw for a bed. The cottage. They had only gone a short distance, when they came upon a little cottage in a floral garden. They could smell the flowers scent in the breeze, it was made of straw and had a tile roof. Someone must live there Papa, let us go knock at the door. They knocked on the door and a tiny little voice answered from within. Yes, who is there? We are a poor father and son without bread and without a roof. Just turn the key and the door will open. Pinocchio turned the key and the door opened, they both went in, looking for the owner. They looked here, there and everywhere but could find nobody, they looked at each other. Oh where is the master of the house? I am up here. They looked up at the ceiling and on the beam was, none other than, the talking cricket. This startled little Pinocchio, for he remembered what had happened the last time they met. Oh my dear little cricket, it is you. Ah, now you call me your dear little cricket. Do you not remember the time you hit me with the mallet to drive me from your home? Yes, you are right cricket, drive me away, throw the mallet back at me. But please have pity on my poor papa, he is starving. I will have pity on both father and son, but I wish to remind you that we should always be kind to those we meet. Then we may expect them to be kind to us in our hour of need. Oh, yes, you are right talking cricket. I'm sorry a thousand times for what happened the last time we met. I shall always remember the lesson you have taught me. Pinocchio made a bed of straw for weary Geppetto to lay upon. Where can I get a glass of milk for my poor papa? Three fields off from here there lives a gardener who keeps cows. Go to him and get the milk you are in want of. Pinocchio left the cottage and ran like the wind to the gardeners where he was welcomed. Sir the talking cricket sent me to you to get some milk for my poor papa. Well and good, just how much milk do you want? A glassful is all, sir. A glassful of milk costs a halfpenny. begin by giving me that. Oh, but I have no money sir. That is very bad marionette, if you have no halfpenny, then you shall have no milk. Yes. That is too bad, I will leave, but my poor papa is sick and needed some milk. Well wait a minute, perhaps we can make a bargain, if you are willing to work. Will you turn the pumping machine for me? Sir, what is a pumping machine? It is a wooden pole that is used to draw up water from the well to water the garden. Yes, that is, you can try me. Well then, if you will draw up a hundred buckets of water you may have a glass of milk for your pay. The gardener led him to the garden and taught him how to turn the pumping machine. Oh, never, before had he worked so hard, but he worked and sweat and grew tired but did it. When he finished his task he took the glass full of milk to the home of the talking cricket. After that every morning, for five months he was up early and went to the pumping machine. 
In this way he earned the milk that was of such benefit to Geppetto with his very poor health. He learned to weave baskets of rushes and sold them for money to provide for their needs. He worked and worked and became very good at what he did, saving money all the time. Pinocchio wanted to become a gentleman and to get a new coat, it would cost 40 cents. I am going to the store and buy myself a new coat. When I return I shall be so well dressed that you will mistake me for a fine gentleman. He left the house and ran merrily along, then he heard someone call out to him by his name. He turned and looked to see who it could be and saw the servant of the fairy with blue hair. Oh, it is you who called me and how is my beautiful little fairy? My dear Pinocchio, the fairy is lying in bed at the hospital. She is so poor that she has not enough money to buy herself a mouthful of bread. I'm very sad to say she is really very weak. Oh my, is it really so? My poor beautiful fairy, poor fairy. If I had a million dollars I would give them all to her but I only have 40 cents. I was going to the store to buy a new coat but you take this money to her at once. But Pinocchio what about your new coat? What does a new coat matter? I would sell these rags that I have on to help the fairy. Just come to the Talking Cricket's home in two days and I shall give you some more money. That night instead of going to bed at 10 Pinocchio sat up until midnight, he worked late. Instead of making just 8 baskets like he usually did, he now made twice as many, 16. He grew so tired that he could not help but fall to sleep, he was quite worried about the fairy. Geppetto snored away, as little Pinocchio sobbed a bit in worry for her, then dreamed of her. Pinocchio becomes a real boy. The sun had long since come up, when Pinocchio awoke, he dreamed of the fairy all night. Quite surprised was he, when he sat up in bed, as he shook the dreams now from his head. For he looked at his hands and then his feet, why he was no longer a marionette, no, not at all. In fact he stood up and felt about 10 feet tall, he stretched his arms and moved his little feet. He had now become a real living boy with a pounding, yes and very real heartbeat, it was true. He found in his room a fine new suit of colorful clothes, he dressed himself up very quickly. There was a cap and a shiny pair of shoes that fit him just right, he went to surprise his papa. It was all finally true, suddenly there was stardust all around, quite magically he danced about. He felt into the pocket of his new clothes and found a little purse and a short note of blue. He shook it and heard there was something inside, it jingled like fine bells, he read the note. The fairy with blue hair returns the 40 cents to her dear Pinocchio. Yes, and she thanks him for his generosity and very good heart. Pinocchio then opened the purse, instead of just 40 pennies, inside was 40 gold pieces. He then went to look at himself in the mirror and really thought it was someone else, not he. No, he did not see a wooden marionette at all, but a bright boy with brown hair and blue eyes. He danced about and felt as happy as he ever did on those most wonderful Easter holidays. Oh my, where can my papa be? Then he went into the next room and found a very happy and healthy Geppetto, carving wood. He ran to his papa's side, threw his arms around him, he hugged him and hugged him again. Papa, you are well again. Just what has made this sudden change in our home? Pinocchio it was you who has made the change my beautiful boy. Oh no, how could this be? 
I have done nothing, you are joking me. When bad boys become good boys, really good boys. They bring happiness and true happiness always brings more happiness. Just as true misery brings always just more misery. Well, well and good. But what has happened to the wooden marionette, where has it gone? That old wooden head? Why it is right over there, see it leaning against that chair? They both looked upon what used to be Pinocchio, its head was to one side, it was quite sad. Yes, its arms were dangling and its legs were so crooked it was a wonder it was able to stand. Oh no! To think that old wooden head was me. How foolish was I, when I was that marionette. Papa, I'm so glad, that I have learned good from bad. Bad boys will never have anything, that is very nice. If they do, they stole it and will have to pay a very high price. Thank you dear Papa, for teaching me these things. I must thank the fairy, with blue hair, for granting me my dream. I have now learned to work, be honest and kind to everybody. Yes, I'm very glad to now become a good boy, when with integrity. Oh father, I do love you and I make you very proud of me. You just wait, just wait and see. The end. Pinocchio, the story of a marionette. Once upon a time there was a piece of wood, it was only firewood and was not worth much. At least that is what someone might think, no, this piece contained something quite magical. Then one day an old carpenter, Master Antonio, who many people called Master Cherry, for the end of his nose was quite red, like a ripe cherry, no one knows quite, how it happened. But when Master Cherry found this wood, he was very pleased, he rubbed his hands together. And did so with delight, yes, quite joyfully and he did say these things, out loud, to himself. This wood has come at just the right time, it will make a fine leg for my table, is it time? At that moment he took a sharp axe, to chop away the bark, the axe was up now high in the air. Yes, he was just ready to swing it when from nowhere, it seems, cried a tiny voice, quite fair. Please do not strike me very hard. Now Master Cherry was quite surprised at what he heard that day. He looked and looked around the room, were there children at play? He peered under the bench, in the cupboard, inside the box of shavings. For he knew, that somewhere close there was a child now misbehaving. He even looked outside, up and down the street, for surely he would find. A little boy or little girl running away, laughing all the time. But not one was seen, none at all, he laughed it off, it's true. He scratched his head in disbelief, quite grateful that it was no thief. Oh, I see how it all is, I only thought I heard someone speak. With that he picked up the axe and swung a terrible blow. Ouch, oh no, now you have really hurt me. Shouted the same tiny voice, Master Cherry stood quite still. No he did not move a bone, it was as if he had now turned somehow into stone. His eyes were white and filled with fright, his mouth was wide open. Yes, his tongue hung down, near to the bottom of his chin, such a frown. Where on earth did that little voice come from? There is no one here, is it possible that this wood can speak and cry as a child? I cannot believe it, this is only firewood, if I threw it on the fire I could boil a pot of beans. Can anyone be hiding inside of it? If anyone is hiding in there, I will put a just end to his misery. 
yes, I will settle this at once and for all. With that he picked up the little piece of wood. With all his might he beat it very hard against the wall. Two, then five, then ten times over and over again. Until his hands hurt and swelled, then he did it again. Then he stopped to listen and to see what he could hear. Two minutes passed, then came five, then ten. But he heard absolutely nothing, not a word was said. He looked quite puzzled as he scratched his head. Oh, I see how it all is, I only thought I heard someone speak. He wore a wig and it came loose, his hands hurt but he fixed it. Still, all this time he was quite frightened, he tried to sing for courage. He put the axe aside, took the block plane and tried to smooth the wood. As soon as he did, then it happened again, not like it really should. Stop, you are tickling me. That tiny voice did laugh, again and again, still again. Now Master Cherry did fall down, as if he were struck by lightning. When you think of it all and all, it really was quite frightening. When he opened his eyes he found himself now sitting on the floor. He was quite pale and the end of his nose was not red, but now blue with fright. He moaned and groaned and was not very happy about this curious plight. Master Cherry's visitor. Just then someone came, rap tap tap, knocking upon his door. Master Cherry wondered, oh what now, as he lay there on the floor. Oh, you come in. He groaned a bit, as he looked over to the door, from the floor. A little old man at once came in, after he opened the door. His name was Gippetto, but the bad boys named him Indian Pudding. For his funny yellow wig appeared much too much like pudding. Good day Master Antonio, but why are you laying on the floor? Oh, I'm teaching the ABCs to the little ants, what can I do for you? Gippetto laughed and looked about the messy shop, now so very cluttered. The wood, the axe and even the broom was nearly up in the cupboard. I have a kind favor to ask of you. I am here, ready to serve you, please, what is it you so desire? Master Cherry now gathered his strength and rose now to his knees. It really was his job to please each and every customer. Well, yes, this morning an idea came into my head you see. I thought I might make a wonderful puppet or marionette you know. Yes, well that could well and jump and play like a child. With it I might travel the world and maybe earn myself a fine living. Then came a tiny, boyish little voice that shouted quite out loud. Good for you, Indian pudding, about time you worked. Geppetto grew very angry at Master Antonio and was quite cross. What was that you said, why do you insult me, I should pop you on your head. Poor Master Antonio almost cried, he knew just what had happened. He shook his head and did stand, for fear of being, again, flattened. I did not insult you, I would not do that to you good Geppetto. Yes, yes you did and I heard what you said, although it is not like you Antonio. But I shall not quarrel with you, please, could you give me...